All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are live here at Myth Vision Podcast. I'm feeling good today. I got my coffee in me and uh, have had a wonderful morning with the family getting ready for this interesting historical discussion where you get to ask your questions. Please, I ask everybody who's staying tuned here, like the video, share this with somebody out there that is a fanatic about this stuff. I'm such a nerd when it comes to these things. So if they're like us, share it with them or get their attention. This is an opportunity to ask an expert in Josephus. Uh, I say expert. He doesn't like to say that. He's too humble. But uh, someone who at least knows when they don't know something and when they do know something and they've read the literature. And so Dr. Steve Mason is going to be joining us today. With that being said, I want everybody for a moment to consider going and getting a book, right? Buy it for someone if you're interested in doing it for Christmas. That's another way. Uh, there's a lot on Josephus he's written on, and he's definitely delved into the early Christian literature as well. But you could see lots of Josephus and uh, the questions of like, is the testimony of Flavianum, you know, partial interpolation, holy, whole interpolation, you know, the, lots and lots of questions. So be sure to go check out his books and also Myth Vision's Patreon. This is how I keep doing what I'm doing. Ladies and gentlemen, this interview I haven't released yet. I was just talking to Dr. Mason about it, Do Dr. Robin Faith Walsh. This is going to be an amazing interview. I have not released it yet. This this is Patreon only right now, but I swear on this video, you're going to be blown away by the material and lots of other stuff that you know I post early. You also get to steer the content. It helps me keep doing what I'm doing. Consider becoming a patron. With that being said, let's start with our intro and continue into the show. Don't any of you have that guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game. Wow. <laughs> Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Dr. Steve Mason, welcome back to Myth Vision and thank you for the wow on the intro. I love that scene. I, I incorporated it into my intro about the whole I'm your Huckleberry, you know. Hey, I, li I like this one a lot better, actually. I think it's <laughs> very cool. Thank very you. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, I hope everything's going good where you're at and you're ready to hang out with me for a little yeah. while. Hey, we just went into full lockdown here, so I've got nothing else to do <laughs> except uh, <laughs> get harassed by Myth Vision followers. Absolutely, who who wouldn't want to do that? That's the best. Uh, we do have some great questions. Always amazing people who are in the comment section. When I'm down and out, and I come on here and I don't really share what I'm going through, uh, just a tough moment. They always lift me up. There's always something that. Uh, just helps me get through the day, you know, and there's a lot of wonderful people. I've met some of them in person, actually, when I went to the Faithless Forum in Texas not too long ago. And and uh, hopefully one day I can catch you when you're in the States. When you come yeah. to do a presentation, I could pull you aside and we do some in-persons. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because to us, you're a legend. To you, you're huh. just a mortal. But uh, we're, we're, we're definitely seeing you as walking on water here, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Let me let me shrink your head real quick. Hold on. No, I'm just kidding. So, oh, we already have a super chat. Awesome. So everyone who's tuning in, if you want to ask a question, please uh, help us out with super chats, and I will help you out with getting your questions asked to Dr. Mason. And here we go. First one, Dr. Mason. Uh, my friend Charles Wilcox, thank you so much for the super chat, my friend, and I hope your day is going well. Christianity began in Asia, Antioch, while Rav Shal, I think he's talking about Paul, yeah. Spent a year there. It was problematic. Acts eleven twenty six. Rav Shaw was depre uh, was de depressed. So wanting to die over failing Asia's Asian assemblies. Connect the dots for us. Do you know what he's talking about? Yeah, I have an idea. Yeah. Okay, I'm, um, I'm I'm lost. Okay, well this this could be the whole the whole broadcast right here the podcast. So um, <laughs> let me. And maybe uh, maybe Charles will is 
is he able to come back and clarify uh, if I? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So he cites the book of Acts, first of all, for Paul. So chapter 11 and the book of Acts. Uh, I think uh, historians who work on Paul generally uh, recognize Acts to be a secondary source that is written a generation or two or three, maybe, after Paul's life. Uh, so Paul's letters are really the, you know, the, the primary evidence, uh, at least those that he, most people think, wrote. Um, he actually wrote them. So, I mean, if Paul wrote letters, uh, if you don't go the, the route that these are second century creations by somebody else, if Paul wrote letters, which uh, I think is most likely, then there are about seven letters that are genuine. And he talks in those letters at first hand about his crisis in, in Asia. So what Charles is talking about is the province, uh, the, the Roman province of Asia, not Asia as we think of it, right? East Asia, Southeast Asia, not like that. But the Roman province of Asia was Western Turkey uh, today, we would call it. And there, uh, Paul has a kind of a base in Ephesus, the, the, the city of Ephesus near the western edge. And that's where he apparently writes, especially the letter to the Philippians. So the letter to people in Philippi, uh, the town of Philippi, which is a Roman colony taking over an old city that was uh, named after Philip the Macedonian, you know, Alexander the Great's uh, dad. Um, so this is Philippi. And Paul had stopped there at the first, as the first stop on his way through heading west on the Via Egnatia, the main highway, right? So anyway, the point is that uh, he gets back to Ephesus, apparently, uh, and is thrown in... Um, I hesitate to use the word uh, jail because it's not a jail like we would think of a jail, like with sheriff and bars and whatnot, you know, and guns. But um, but a jail. Um, he's he's in custody. He's put in chains, and held by by some officials there. And uh, it seems that there the, the, these are members even of the imperial household somehow around there. Uh, so he's he's held in some kind of custody for. Uh, he, he's afraid he's going to die. Uh, he says right in that letter to the people of Philippi, thanking them for their support to him uh, ever since what he calls the beginning of his uh, announcement. Um, he thinks he might die. So I think what Charles is talking about is this long period he spends in uh, in Ephesus in the province of Asia. Um, I'm not sure how Antioch uh, fits in there. But anyway, if if this is the if this is the issue, so I'll, I'm trying to join the dots here mm -hmm. uh, as requested. Um, yeah, so the so the thing is that Paul says in this letter, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to me if I'm. Th this is the famous line that's kind of a stoic line. I've learned to be content with whatever you know, whatever I've got. If I'm if I'm feasting, if I'm rich, I'm content. If I've got nothing, I'm content. Uh, so anyhow, that's uh, those are the dots I can think of joining. Um, but he survives. You know, he comes out of it. Uh, and uh, so he goes on to do his thing in, in, in the rest of the West. Yeah. Interesting. OK, uh, Charles, uh, I hope that answered it. So thank you so much for that super chat. I'm just getting everybody's attention here in the chat, letting you know I see you. I really appreciate it. I, I seriously appreciate everyone's compliments, especially for Dr. Mason, because you know, uh, you know, when I first introduced you to the channel, <clears throat> I didn't know what I was getting. Honestly, I was like, oh, you know, OK, he's a Josephus scholar. And then you came on and you methodologically like. I you forced us, OK, I, I want to go ahead and tell you, you absolutely coerced us into thinking like we probably haven't thought before, like there's not been any scholars who methodologically approach this stuff as careful, as respectful you know, in terms of, well, we don't know that. I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't have the answer. Well, I think I know. Here's a good answer. I think, you know, that kind of stuff. That's a scholar. To me, a scholar, someone who knows their boundaries and stuff and isn't dogmatic. Now, I'm not saying all scholars aren't dogmatic. I'm just saying I like the ones that know their boundaries and aren't extremely 
dogmatic. So a couple more super chats, Dr. Mason. Yeah. Aaron, my thank you. Thank you so much for that super chat. I really appreciate it. Hi, Steve. What are the sources for the Assyrian Babylonian era? Just Herodotus, as Tovis, Tovia Singer seems to suggest, or are there multiple attestations? The Okay, the Assyrian Babylonian era. So this is a long period. Um, right. You have the first Assyrians, you know, back in uh, 1800 BCE and Babylonians uh, following, and then you have uh, what are often called the Neo-Assyrians, of course, <laughs> uh, 2.0, uh, from the uh, 8th century, uh, late 9th, 8th century BC uh, onward for a, a century and a half, two centuries, and then a uh, shift uh, where the uh, Babylonians uh, take over, and then after them come the Persians, so the Neo-Assyrians and the Neo-Babylonians. I'm guessing that Aryan is asking about the Neos uh, rather than the original ones. The original ones, um, you have the Law Code of Hammurabi is one of the most famous uh, uh, Babylonian texts from the what, 18th, 17th century BC. Uh, now, I have to tell you, this is at the very extreme limits of my, uh, my competence. I don't work in these areas at all. I work in the Greco-Roman period, uh, so from 300 BC to 500 CE. That's for me. That's enough. It's like 800 years. <laughs> but that, that's enough to try to get lost in. Um, but so this is earlier. But yeah, there's more evidence. So there's there is the Bible, but you have the Babylonian Chronicle. You have uh, sort of inscriptions, uh, Babylonian inscriptions. Um, so there's other evidence, for example, for Cyrus uh, allowing the Jews to return from Babylonia to uh, Jerusalem not just the Bible, uh, and, and you can get some perspective on him uh, uh, that way, outside the Bible, yeah. Yeah, the, I've even heard some people try to make the case that, how do I put this kindly? Uh, they'll like put a lot of weight on the Cyrus thing and be like, well, he wouldn't have sent them back with money to rebuild the temple if it weren't God. That had, and it's like, no, when you read the histories that are outside the Bible, he did this for everyone. He yeah, wanted yeah, all. Yeah. So people want to make it unique about them. Yeah. Everybody's special in some way. But when yeah. you try to raise your special above everyone else, that's something here at Myth Vision I personally do try to tackle. Because yeah. I think we all need to see each other on the same playing field. That's me. But Yeah, in context is everything, right? For historical research, you're exactly right, uh, Derek. So like uh, with Cyrus, for example, I mean, it's just not, it's, one policy is to take all the elites from, from a conquered country and bring them to your country. Uh, but then you've got to settle them all, take care of them, find work for them. Uh, and you leave, your, you leave the original place unproductive because you've taken all the elites. This is, by the way, I mean, it's not unlike the problem after, at the end of the Second World War, what to do with Germany. Uh, as the allies were winning the, the war, there was a big debate going on, you know, should we reduce it to basically a big farmland or remove all the industry, right? Or remove all the heads of industry, not kill them, but just remove, remove industry from Germany so it can never be a threat again. Or do you let it prosper and then try to rebuild its self-respect in a more productive way? And that's the, the view that, that won out. That's very similar, actually, to Cyrus's, um, uh, in my mind, uh, yeah. which could, could be a little crazy. But uh, in my mind, it's a little similar to what Cyrus did. So right. instead of denuding uh, Judea and making it unproductive and removing all the elites, he said, no, send them back home, uh, rebuild the temple, let them prosper. We get the money. We get, we get the taxation. We get the tribute. Uh, everybody's happy. It's a win-win. Why, we don't want them here, uh, you know, send, send them back. But, of course, he only sent uh, a, a small portion back. Uh, lots of Jews stayed in, uh, in Babylonia. It is interesting, too. He's, he's made into a hero, a Messiah figure. So Yeah, well, already yeah. second Isaiah in the Bible, yeah, it calls him God's anointed. Uh, uses the same term that would be used for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. right? He's the Mashiach, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. My good friend, Neil Gnostic informant has a super chat, but before I do, if you haven't subscribed to his YouTube channel, please do. I'll put it in the chat in just a second. 
he just dropped this really good video with uh, M. David Litwa on um, his whole The Evil Creator book. And he goes deeper than I did in terms of the details there. But seriously, uh, this was this was an amazing interview. He does a great interviews all the time. I consider this like a sister channel of mine. So if you have not subscribed, let me put it down here in the chat right now. So you guys can go subscribe to my buddy, Neil. Even if you're watching this later, you can watch the live feed. And, and here is the link. Be sure to go do that. So Neil's question, Dr. Mason. Dr. Mason, do you know what was the aftermath of the children of Flavius Josephus, Agrippa, Titus, and Justus, and if they made any contribution to Roman history or vanish with no trace? Okay. Um, let's take them in order. Um, well, let's take them in reverse order. That's maybe easier. Justice, if, if it's justice of Tiberius, uh, which is in question, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm not sure. Um, uh, clarify for us, justice of Tiberius, Neil, just to be sure, but, but go ahead. Uh, yeah. So if it's justice of Tiberius, this is a guy who uh, was from the town of Tiberius, obviously, and opposed Josephus, uh, at least in, in literary terms. He wrote a book attacking him. And so when Josephus writes his autobiography, he responds to justice in part. It's not clear he wrote it in order to respond to justice, but he does. And, and really. Uh, the sons of Josephus. Uh, oh, the son of Josephus called justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Oh, I see. I see. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about different different people. Yeah. So it's not Titus. It's uh, Hyrcanus is the other one then. So Agrippa Simonides uh Hyrcanus and Justus yeah are the surviving sons of I sorry I was thinking you were saying the sons of or the children of Josephus of Agrippa of Titus and of Justus but yeah I think you mean uh so the three sons of Josephus that survived yeah I think no. so yeah no not at all <laughs> so the short answer is no um they may well have done done amazing things I'm sure each one was as talented as uh, we tell all our children they are. And, uh, you know, the, um, each one is, uh, is special. But remember that we hardly have any records from the ancient world, right? I mean, mm -hmm. most of what happened has disappeared. So if, if we just think about it, I mean, the short answer is no. Um, we, don't, we only know about them. We only know their names because Josephus happened in his second last text that he wrote to mention them, right, in his autobiography. If he hadn't written his autobiography, we wouldn't even know about them at all. So that's one thing to remember. Um, uh, second thing is Josephus himself was quite impactful. So if we just think about it logically, if these guys grew up in Rome with a very famous, well, relatively famous dad, one would think you know, that they would have some kind of, um, you know, some social circles in Rome. But we have no idea. We can't get beyond that. Thank so you short, for that. The short answer was no. <laughs> yeah, you made you make me want to find out more about this justice in his histories. I wish we found him, just to be honest. I, it would be awesome to see what he might have said and what was going on, uh, especially since they were competitive. It's kind of like, yeah. uh, who's the early, who's the earlier historian that was competing that, that, Justin uh, or Josephus is writing against is it Appian? Yeah, Appian. Uh, you know, I'd love to see what Justice had to say. It'd be interesting. So yeah, that Justice of Tiberius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah. So many things. Probably you have so much in your mind about that. I'm sure from studying. No, not really. I don't have anything in my mind. You know, it's like uh, clear as a mirror a glass. I feel like I don't know anything. It's a curious thing that um, people think that professors know stuff. Uh, uh, and historians know a lot of things. And I, my, my experience of life is that, uh, I mean, I, I don't feel like I know anything at all, but that what happens is it's all uh, social, it's all dynamic and engaging. And so when there's a stimulus, you know, somebody asks you a question, each time that you try to answer a question or try to answer a question of your own, you formulate things in a new way, right? It's not like, it's not like you pull out of a drawer 
you know, item number 1B7 um, that's ready made. <laughs> it's rather much more organic, I think. I don't know if that sounds a little woo woo. Uh, no, no, I mean for, for your show, but uh, <laughs> but but I but I don't think that it's I don't think I'm, I've come to think that memory doesn't work that way, at least for me, because right. most of the time I feel like I don't know anything at all. Um, You've um, read so much, though. There's the, the point is is you have a better grip of at least reading the material, whether you're wrong about your conclusions or not. The point is, it does stimulate thought. It's kind of like art. Yeah, You know, it yeah. is an art. And I think it's really interesting to get that art down. Yeah. And each historian has a different paintbrush, so to speak. So this yeah, is what yeah. makes it fun. Well, it's the same with every single person who's watching here. You know, every person is is really radically an individual. Yeah. Uh, and it's no two people know the same things. That's what I guess that's another way of saying what I'm trying to say is that you could talk to all the people who came through with me who took the same courses in the Ph.D. program. Uh, who taught similar courses in university, but you know we're going to have very different perspectives, <laughs> just like any other two people have different perspectives on things. Because that, that's what I mean. It's organic, and so the the experience you have learning and asking your own questions is somehow, in some mysterious way, woven into the fabric of your being. You know, uh, but it's not like there's a place where you know stuff. It's right. like um, it's all it's all dynamic somehow. Thank you so much. Our yeah. good friend, Tim. Tim is in the chat, Tim Mills, and he super chatted six, six, six. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> I appreciate you, brother. I love you. Hey, everybody. Also, Tim is another. So I did a video specifically promoting Tim's channel. Oh, whose eye is that? Hmm. It's the all-seeing eye where I get paid by the Illuminati. No, I'm um, just kidding. <laughs> People actually think that. Uh, Tim has a YouTube channel, also a sister YouTube channel. I'm commenting it in the chat. If you haven't subscribed to him, you're going to probably end up going to a place that burns people forever. I'm just saying. I'm not trying to be rude. Anyway, seriously, though, go and check out Tim. Thank you so much for the super chat. Dr. Mason, what philosophers, authors, or even movies have most positively influenced your worldview and outlook? Hey, Tim, thank you very much for this, my friend. Uh, this is a nice uh, softball question um, <laughs> and allows me to indulge. Uh, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very generous of you to ask that question. Um, so come back to this organic thing, organic growth. So it's very difficult to say uh, who's, who's impacted me the most because uh, in a way, those that I met when I was an undergraduate and read when I was an undergraduate had the, had the most impact in the sense that that underlay everything else. Right. Uh, but then of course, all along the way, then you, you read, you encounter, you meet, uh, others who also make a big impact. So, and, and maybe in some, like, this is a debate that we have with Josephus. I've often said Josephus is the most impactful writer of the ancient world outside the Bible. I had some friends over last night for dinner and they have a big laugh about that because they work in other areas and they can't believe I would say that. Um, uh, so, the, but, but the point is he's early, right? So he's had the longest history of impact much more than, you know, an 18th century philosopher or something like that. So, so it's a difficult question, Tim, to answer actually, but I would say in terms of lingering impact. So, I, I met them, I liked them, I kept reading them, and I still read them now. Uh, in terms of philosophers, uh, I would say, let's see, uh, the oldies, <laughs> ancient some ancient philosophers, Marcus Aurelius, uh, Epictetus, the freed slave uh, who was a Stoic, uh, Marcus Aurelius, an emperor. So you've got two people at opposite ends of the social scale. But actually, Marcus Aurelius was reading Epictetus, which is quite amazing. But Marcus wow. Aurelius is a, a, an emperor fighting on the frontiers of the Roman Empire and writing his thoughts to himself. And he's been reading that's freed slave from a century earlier, uh, Epictetus. So those two, I think, um, in terms of philosophers in, in the East, certainly uh, Chuangzi and Laozi, uh, Confucius uh, uh, to some extent. I mean, I read him early in university and was really charmed. 
but I think in terms of outlook on life, the Lao Tzu and the, and the Chuang Tzu, um, and forgive my pronunciation, if any of you know Chinese, uh, I read them in translation. And there are many translations available, which actually are quite different from each other. So it's, uh, it's really worth looking at different translations. Um, philosophers, uh, what were the other ones? Uh, authors, authors or authors, even yeah. movies. Or even movies, yeah. Movies, um, I think the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful films I've seen was a Korean film. And I can't remember the order, of, but it was the seasons like spring, summer, autumn, winter, or or maybe starting in autumn, something like that. Hardly any dialogue in the film, but it was uh, sort of philosophically very impactful. Um, I'm not sure that it influenced me all that much, but I enjoyed it a, a huge amount. Um, most of the other films I enjoy are, uh, you know, just entertainment. Um, I don't think they've influenced me all that much. Um, Maybe some damage knee a bit. There was a film <laughs> called uh, The House of Sand and Fog, I remember going to see, and it, it left me <laughs> speechless <laughs> for, for a long time afterwards. And the friend I was with as well, um, just like, wow. Yeah, what's this? I don't know if you've seen it, uh, Ben Kingsley. Uh -huh. But anyway, um, so there, there are things like that. They had a big impact, but you know, uh -huh. I could have done without it probably. Um, what else? Uh, authors. Authors. Yeah, I mean, you know, gosh, that's just uh, people in the field, I suppose. My teachers had a big impact on me. Uh, E.P. Sanders, Ben Meyer, Alan, uh, Al Baumgarten, Albert Baumgarten. Um, yeah, a bunch of those people. Um, but it wasn't so much their writings, really, as their interactions uh, as teachers, also with their writings. But it was the interactions that brought, brought the work to life, you know. Um, and the character of the people themselves. So, uh, um, yeah, authors, hmm. I, I hope that gives you an idea, Tim. Yeah. Thank you, Tim, for the 666. Uh, next super chat, Farsight. Thank you so much. I appreciate your super chat, my friend. How dominant was Judaism in the region and period in question? How common were pagan practitioners like worshipers of Tammuz, Damuzid, Asherah, Ishtar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the region and the period. So we need to try to narrow down which region and which period. Um, Farsight, if you're in the chat, which region and period specifically? But until they answer, maybe you have a, an idea. In the yeah, well, Asherah, Asherah and Ishtar, um, you're talking about sort of um, uh, early uh, Iron Age. Um, so this is, again, far before the Greco-Roman period. Uh, these deities remained, but they took on different uh, names. Uh, they, took on, they sort of morphed over the centuries. So in the, in the first century CE, the first roughly century, around zero. So yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, OK. So around the first century of the Christian era or common era, um, you have, uh, I guess, the equivalence would be um, the, the Dea Syria, the, the Syrian goddess, um, who kind of subsumes um, the earlier ones in the region. Uh, let's unpack some of these terms. So first of all, Judaism. I'm going to be a little bit heretical here, um, but this is a big part of my research, so I'm going to inflict it on you. Uh, that I think it's un unhelpful, actually, in historical terms to talk about ancient Judaism. I do all the time, but just because that's what everybody talks about and I don't want to seem too weird uh, or, you know, uh, nerdy to uh, people I don't need to seem weird or nerdy <laughs> to. Um, so for communication purposes, I say I work in ancient Judaism. There's no problem. Today, of course, there's Judaism. Um, but in the ancient world, the, the Jews, the Judeans, were a people with a place. So it, what I'm getting at is uh, if you look at ancient Judean texts, Josephus, Philo of Alexandria, Letter of Aristeus, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, all these, these famous texts, even the Bible and the Greek translation of the Bible, you don't find any Judaism in there. Um, nobody's talking about Judaism. 
it would be like, uh, it would be, I think, exactly like if uh, someone said, well, what was um, Romism like? Or what was Egyptism like? Or uh, Syriaism, Syriaism. We don't need an ism for these because uh, it's like also, you know, Canadism or um, uh, there, um, we, we do have the word Americanism, but that's more like a figure of speech, right, is an Americanism. But that's restricted to that, that meaning. There's no kind of philosophy that is Americanism, uh, really. Americans, you know, e evidently differ um, <laughs> in politics and all this kind of thing. So there's to, to, to impose an ism on Judea, if you'll bear with me here for a moment, what I'm suggesting to you actually is that this is a Christian creation. When the Christians came to power in the fourth century under Constantine and his successors, that's when this language of isms really took off. And the reason is that the Christians called their own thing Christianism. What, what, what they meant by that, see that in, in Greek, uh, the, 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 the word ending ismos, ismos, that we render as ism, that, that was an action. So think about this for a moment. What is baptism? Uh, either submersion or, if you will, sprinkling of water, however you want to. But it's an action, right? Right. It's an action. Or ostracism. Right. What's ostracism? Uh, you know isn't it uh, put, putting someone on the outside, like an active uh, yeah. pushing someone to the outskirts or something to that effect? Yeah, yeah. Built on the term for uh, bits of uh, uh, pottery on which you draw lots or you 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 choose somebody to be ejected from the community, but it's an action, right? These are action words. Is, ismos words are action words. So this word, yudaismos, it, it does appear a few times, not in the major writers of the ancient world, but it's an action. It means uh, Judaizing. It's like uh, Hellenizing is Hellenismos. Judaizing is Judaismos. Uh, Atticizing, becoming like an Athenian, is Atticismos. Uh, that's behaving like an Athenian. And it's the same with Persian. Uh, if you want to be like a Persian or be like a, a Spartan, that's uh, be becoming like a Spartan is uh, laconismos, <laughs> La uh, laconism, being like a Spartan. So these are action words. They're not belief systems. But when the Christians came to power, because they had been so concerned about spreading their message, which they called Christianizing, uh, therefore, Christianismos, they set up a, the, the, the word morphed in its meaning under their care into a system of belief. And then they reduced every other culture around them to a system of belief. So they reduced the Jews uh, from being a vibrant culture with a city, a mother city, and a temple, and an altar, and ancient history, and all of the traditions and all that. They reduced that to an ism uh, so they could compare it with Christianism. And that's where Judaism was born. So that's mm -hmm. a long explanation. But um, this is why I don't know what Judaism means, actually, in the first century, because there's no, it's like Romism. There's no Romism. Um, but there, so let me, and now we've done that, let's push that aside and say, let's reframe the question, if you don't mind, um, uh, to say, uh, Judeans, uh, how widespread were Judean, Judean communities? That raises another big question for historians. Mm -hmm. um, so many historians have said things like this. The Roman Empire uh, hosted maybe 50 million people altogether, somewhere between 50 and 60 million. These are very, very rough estimates. Mm -hmm. And it used to be said quite often that Jews, Judeans, comprised uh, a tenth, a tenth of that number like five million mm. which is amazing right i mean every one in ten people you would meet would be would be a jew uh that kind of stretches the imagination but many people used to say that and thought of uh jews as uh evangelizing in a way or missionizing proselytizing a lot um so these have been big debates in uh, historical research 
But then more, more recently in the past generation, scholars have begun to question the foundations of that number of uh, 5 million. So I would say today it's much more conservatively estimated, but still there were a lot of Jews in the Roman Empire. So maybe, you know, two and a half, three million. The way you arrive at these numbers is, of course, looking at each city and seeing what evidence you have for the number of Jews there. So, for example, if you look at Alexandria in Egypt, um, uh, careful studies have argued that the population was maybe 600,000. Uh, and then if you figure out all the evidence we have for Jews in the, the city, and we have a fair bit of evidence actually from Philo and Josephus, um, one of the best studies by Diana Dahlia has argued that Jews may have may have constituted like 180,000 of mm. the 600,000. But in Alexandria, they represented a very large minority. So so that's how the numbers were arrived at before, like that 5 million number. If you go around extrapolating that around the empire, most people now think that's too high a number. Um, so maybe total two to three million. That's still a lot. Mm -hmm. Like one one in 20 uh, people is a Jew that you meet. That's still way more than, say, in the U.S. or you know somewhere else in the West uh, today. So that that's a high number. So I, I hope that helps to answer the question. If the question is how widespread were Judeans, uh, there were significant. That they were probably one of the most consistently found minority communities in the cities of the Eastern Roman Empire. So in Antioch. Um, uh, capital of Syria, all through Judea, uh, Alexandria, Cyrene, in the, along the North African coast, and then throughout Asia Minor, uh, Ephesus, uh, those places, Corinth, Athens in Greece, um, Thessalonica, all these places had uh, significant Judean communities. And then when you get to Italy again, not only Rome, which had a sizable Judean community, but also other Italian cities did too. So hmm. yeah, they had a pretty big, uh, pretty big sway. And according to Philo and Josephus, many people were attracted to Judean uh, culture because of this, you know, idea of God as not being able to be represented by statues uh, or the, the way that, you know, Greco-Roman gods were portrayed. Uh, the Judean God was sort of sublime and it, invisible and you couldn't see or describe God. And many philosophically minded people thought this was admirable. Even Tacitus, the Roman historian, who, uh, who ridicules Jews in many ways for their, some of their customs, he thinks this idea of God is actually pretty good. You know, it's like one of the best out there. Wow. Interesting. There are so many questions that come up from this, uh, and I don't want us to wrap each other because I got other questions. This is your time to ask questions, and of course, thanks for all the super chats. But uh, proselytes, like, there's so many questions about the activities that were going on, uh, especially when the rise of Christianity comes on the scene. There seems to be competing activities. Of I, I just have so much, doc, Dr. Mason, that maybe we can get into maybe today or in other shows. And it doesn't always have to be you working your butt off to come up with presentations because you do really well with that but uh you have a lot of insight and people are enjoying that so thank you lucas hunt Thanks. thank you for the super chat and also zeng says uh, uh just to make the comment here i was reading i note dr mason was chair at aberdeen one of my kids is there now so that's awesome <laughs> thank you so much for that super chat though lucas i seriously appreciate the support nikolai i appreciate your super chat now or, or how and when did uh, monogamy become the standard what is the history of this who was yeah. the pioneer in this? Jews, Romans, <laughs> Greeks? <laughs> yeah, this is very, this is a very interesting question. Uh, you know, um, we, we tend today to assume that monogamy was always, well, let's say Christian people raised in Christian tradition assume that monogamy was sort of always there yeah. somehow, at least in principle. Because when Jesus talked about marriage, you know, he said a man and a woman will, you know, will leave their father and mother and become one flesh. And so this idea of like two people become one, that's it, a couple. Um, what's curious, as 
you will all know, your viewers will all know, in the Bible, uh, that wasn't the case. So Solomon had uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines, something like that. Um, he wasn't so wise. <laughs> no, well, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of birthdays to, um, to, to manage, <laughs> yeah. let alone anything else. So um, there's nothing in the Bible like that, you know, and so uh, there's multiple marriage all over the place. It's a question of what you can afford. So most likely, um, I mean, it, it looks like in the vast majority of households, it was simply a matter of economics. Only kings and really rich people, rich males, could afford to have, you know, uh, harems and um, uh, multiple sexual partners, uh, however they're called, some kind of wives. Um, how exactly that changed? Well, I, I think it's pretty clear that it was under uh, Greek and Roman influence. So, so you, you have two different issues here. One's just the practical issue that the vast majority of people are poor and uh, a, a, a farmer, uh, a, an artisan, a day laborer is going to be lucky if he can support one wife and children. And remember that, of course, you're dealing with a time when there's no effective birth control, uh, anything like that. So people are just having lots and lots of children, many of them, up to half of them dying in uh, childbirth or soon after. So this is, is really a, a very different world from our world. Uh, but the, the, the sheer economics of the situation would dictate that the vast majority of people could only have, like, they, there could only be one couple. And also, you know, common morality of being faithful to your spouse would grow up from this, from this reality, right? Because if people are running around on their spouses, then, you know, it's just chaos um, in, a, in a time without effective birth control and with, uh, I guess, disease as well. It didn't seem to be as common as it is in the modern world, but still. Um, so I, I guess there's that practical development. But then... On the other hand, in the Greek and Roman worlds, um, especially the Roman world we know um, most about, monogamy is the norm. Um, the, it just always was. So it looks like under Roman influence, um, Jews living under Roman influence or Greco-Roman influence um, evolved into this idea of one, one husband, one wife. I've also heard, just throwing this out there, a lecture by Christine Hayes that uh -huh. said that the, the, the Hellenism influenced the Jews to a point where when you look at, for example, matriarch or patriarch systems, uh, they were more matriarchal and that this might have impacted the gospel authors in having this lineage, potentially a genealogical connection through the mother's line. And, and you would go through like Jewish literature, you'd go, no, 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 it's got to be the male, but not necessarily when Hellenism comes in, this would have to a reader who's reading this in the Greek Roman world would have said, no, no, it's okay. It's through the mother's line because of the Greco-Roman influence. I could be wrong, but is do you think there's something to that? Um, I would put it a little bit differently. Uh, okay. So a, a scholar named uh, Shai Cohen in New York has, and now at Harvard has, um, has written some interesting stuff on the origin of patrilineal descent. Uh, and I think uh, or the origin of matrilineal descent, pardon me. So yes, in the Bible, it's patrilineal descent. And that just seems like if you've got a clear family unit, right, in a sort of patriarchal society, then it's, it's clear that the son is, you know, oldest son kind of, you know, mm -hmm. is the most prominent one. And then it takes the, like the, the birthright stories in the Bible, right? Esau and Jacob, that kind of thing. Um, it's a very primal kind of instinct that uh, g lines go through the father and the genealogies of the Bible, therefore, go through the father. What changed? Um, I think a lot of people think um, that um, what changed was war and captivity. And so, so the problem is that if there's a high likelihood of rape or even not a high likelihood, but a, a decent possibility, 
uh, which there is. I mean, in some of Josephus' comments, it appears that there's almost an expectation that any woman who's been a prisoner of war will have been raped. So then you, you have the question, how do you know who the father is of, of a child, right? Um, you, you know who the mother is as long as there's been continuity of custody. Um, you know who the, or you're almost certain to know who the mother is, but who the father is, is, you, you know, nobody really knows, um, in, in general. So, um, I think many people think that's the origin of, uh, matrilineal descent so that as everybody will know today, Jewish identity passes through the mother. So in Jewish law and how the question is, who's your mother, not who your father was, hmm. um, yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh, thank you. Appreciate you. I had to tack that on with that interesting question. Thank you so much, Nikolov. Lucas Hunt, appreciate the super chat, my friend. Did Antiochus actually invade Jerusalem after defeating Egypt? Antiochus left Egypt through a celebration with the money he took from Egypt's temples. Okay, I guess this is talking about Antiochus IV um, and his conflict with uh, Ptolemies uh, in, uh, in the 160s uh, BCE. I guess that's the question uh, because the, you, you have slightly conflicting stories in 1st and 2nd Maccabees, um, putting all the pieces together. So coming back to your observation, Derek, that there's a lot we don't know. Uh, this is a little bit sketchy, but what is clear is that Antiochus, because this is known also from Polybius outside of 1st and 2nd Maccabees, uh, Antiochus IV uh, was trying to, was feeling very confident. Um, so there's a, con here's, here's the background. There's a conflict between the Seleucids or Seleucids who are based up in Antioch and uh, Syria which is now actually in Turkey. It's uh, just in the border of Turkey, Antakya, uh, but it was Antioch and it was the sort of capital of the entire Levant, the entire Eastern coast of the Mediterranean, uh, Syria. Um, so that, that's uh, the, the Seleucids. And then the Ptolemies were based in Alexandria in Egypt and Judea, southern, what, what is Koile Syria, southern Syria was always, um, a bone of contention between them. So it had been under Ptolemaic rule from 300 BC confirmed until about 200, 198 BCE. Uh, it had been part of the Ptolemaic empire based in Egypt. I realize there's no point doing gestures because I'm thinking <laughs> one way and uh, you're looking another way. I don't know. But anyhow, um, uh, but uh, so so uh, then the Seleucids uh, took took it from the Ptolemies, took Jerusalem and Judea from the Ptolemies, made it part of the Seleucid Empire, right? Uh, and then the king, the new king Antiochus the Fourth, is really feeling strong, so he thinks he's going to do more than that, and he's got this big old conflict with the Ptolemies going, so he he marches right into Egypt, uh, but. He gets his, his his ass kicked in Egypt, not by the Ptolemies, uh, because there's a young king on the throne, and he thinks he can take advantage of the situation there. The Romans show up. Mm. The Romans show up with in the person of a Roman uh, uh, general, a commander, consul, who um, who, uh, according to this story, it's a famous story. He draws a line around uh, Antiochus and tells him. Uh, you know, you better, you have to decide before you step out of this circle what you're going to do. Uh, are you going to go home peacefully or, you know, you're going to deal with Rome? So he decides to go home. <laughs> now, somehow uh, on his way home, uh, that's when the persecution in Jerusalem, his persecution of the Jews begins in intensively. So how to put all these pieces together? According to Second Maccabees, uh, the the issue between Antiochus and Jerusalem was not started by Antiochus. It was, and also according to First Maccabees, it was started by some leaders in Jerusalem who wanted to be more and more closely connected with Antiochus's cool kingdom of you know, Greco-Roman 
stuff, games, gymnasium, uh, all the Greek style, you know, sports, entertainments, things like that. They wanted a kind of cool life. And so they approached him and said, you know, would you allow us to build a gymnasium to train our young men to become citizens? Could we have a normal kind of citizenship even in Antioch, whether they wanted to rename Jerusalem Antioch or whether they wanted citizenship in the big Antioch? It's not clear. Um, anyway, wow. uh, according to Second Maccabees, they got all Greek. You know, these uh, Jewish priests, even the priests who were serving in the temple. Aren't they uh, reversing their circumcision and stuff at this yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that they wouldn't look unusual, right, as mm -hmm. as exercising. And, and they were hot for wrestling and they didn't even want to serve in the temple anymore. They were waiting for the listening for the wrestling gong to begin that go and go and participate in sports. So anyway, according to second Maccabees, that's how it began. But somehow this trip to Egypt to come back to the question, uh, was an aggravation. Uh, so, so Antiochus, uh, allowed them to do this. Then there was pushback against this from more conservative Jews who said, no, 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 this is against custom. It's against tradition. And somehow in there, it was uh, he, maybe he heard, according to one account, he heard uh, that there was a revolt against him while he was away because he was out of his, um, his kingdom. And so he came back in fury, you know, and enacted these harsh measures against Jerusalem. Uh, or it could just be that he was humiliated, if you want a more kind of uh, psychological explanation, he was humiliated by the Romans and felt that he could now, you know, the way that typically a boss gets uh, told off by a higher boss and then turns around, takes it out. Yeah. On the, you the kick underling. your neighbor's dog when your yeah, neighbor exactly, pisses you exactly. off. Yeah, that, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> so then he enacted these very harsh measures against Jerusalem uh, that, you know, he banned Sabbath observance, forced them to eat pork, sacrificing uh, um, Baal, to Baal, the, the Syrian god, on the altar in Jerusalem, that kind of stuff. And this spawned, of course, the Hasmonean revolt. Hmm. Jeez. It, you know, history is fun, like exploring these things. Thank you, Lucas. I appreciate your answer, Dr. Mason. Jonas, uh, thank you for the super chat. When and how did the concept of converting to or joining the Jewish people originate? So yeah. this is such a million dollar question. I don't know if there's one answer. This is why it's so, uh, no, I love it's, this. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, well, the first one of the, well, the very first account, I guess you have is, is Abraham before there was a Jewish people, right? Uh, he comes from uh, Chaldea um, in uh, Babylonia um, and he conceives of the idea of the one God. Um, and, uh, you know, God speaks to him and he, he, he founds the nation. So in some sense, he's a convert. But the first kind of big um, story is, of course, the book of uh, Ruth uh, in the Bible, the Moabite, the Moabitess, the woman of Moab, uh, one of Israel's neighbors who decides uh, to follow her uh, uh, mother-in-law back to Jerusalem. And Leonard Cohen made a made a beautiful song out of this um whether, but i can't remember the lyrics but it's like you know wherever you go i where you go i will go but it's 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 more poetic than that whither whither thou goest i will go something like that from the king james version um your god shall be my god your people shall be my people mm -hmm. um this is the origin of the idea. Uh, so in the Bible, you have this terminology for resident aliens. And this comes back to my earlier comments. It's not about Judaism. It's not a religious conversion. It's much more like what we would call, like, like me, moving to another country, right? And, and taking up their customs, their laws, their citizenship. That's what it's really like in the ancient world. And that paradigm continues all the way through the rise of Christianity in the fourth century CE. So even Philo and Josephus, when they talk about foreigners becoming attracted to their ways and wanting to become Judeans, 
The most famous example of this is the royal family of Adiabene. And Adiabene is in, uh, is in uh, what would now is northern Iraq uh, between two rivers in the city of uh, Erbil or Arbela. Uh, it's pronounced different ways, and I, I don't know Arabic very well at all. So uh, I, I'm getting it all wrong, but Erbil or Arbela in, nor in northern Iraq was the base of where Adiabene was. And these people, back in the first century, in the 30s of the first century, the royal family of that little, little kingdom uh, became attracted to Judean ways. And they, uh, Josephus has a very elaborate story of how they then came to visit Jerusalem. And the queen uh, spent a huge amount of money because there was a famine in Jerusalem, and she used her own money to buy food from Cyprus and from Egypt and bring it in and support the Jerusalemites. Then she built a palace. Several members of her family built palaces in Jerusalem, and they sent their sons to be educated in Jerusalem and learn, you know, Judean languages and laws and customs. So this is the royal family of another place. You know, it, it, this is usually called religious conversion. But I'm, what I'm trying to say is I don't there's no category of religion in the ancient world. So it's not really conversion in the way we think of religious conversion. It's much more like, uh, you know, really liking another culture and going to live there and, and adopting its ways and becoming a citizen. And so actually this queen was buried there in Jerusalem. I visited the, the tombs of her family um, and the, the sarcophagus is in the Louvre in, uh, in Paris. Um, so, I mean, th these are people who actually put their money where their mouth was. And, you know, they didn't just say, I feel I feel Jewish um, uh, <laughs> somehow. Uh, I like Jew Jewish food. Yeah, I like hummus or whatever. Uh, they didn't do that. They actually went and joined the Jewish people. And, and let and, me ask you this. What yeah. kind of pushback? Because this question is a really interesting one. Yeah. What kind of pushback within the Jewish people? was there on not allowing people who are not Jewish to become Jewish? Is that anachronistic? Are people today, is modern concepts of it looking back on, that's not allowed, you can't ever become a Jew? Or was it like 50-50? Like, what is your idea on that? In the, in it ancient? changed through time. Uh, and, and there's been a lot of debate about, is what, what I think is largely pointless debate about whether Jews in the first century were uh sort of missionizing, proselytizing. Um, there have been several books written on the subject, um, but I think it's a little bit of a pointless discussion. Uh, what, what's clear, uh, like, first of all, we can rule out that they were like Christian missionaries uh, going around trying to proselytize in that way. There's just no evidence for that at all. But what there's plenty of evidence for is people being attracted to Judean culture and ways and other Judeans, uh, people already Judeans, facilitating that and encouraging that. I would argue that a couple of Josephus' works are intended to, to encourage. Uh, so he's already got an audience of non-Jews. His audiences are not Jewish. He's writing for people who are not Jewish. And he's, uh, he's certainly not discouraging them. He's telling stories of people who did adopt Judean law and prospered mm -hmm. uh, in doing so. So, so I, my, my own view is that, that that's what was happening, is that there were significant numbers of people very much attracted by, you know, we, we might think, well, why would you be attracted by, if you're male, you have to undergo circumcision. But even in Paul's letters, you see, that some of his followers were willing to undergo circumcision in order to follow Judean law in the letter to the Galatians, um, unless he's just making that up. I mean, but people did it. We know of other people. We, we know even of rulers who wanted to marry Judean princesses and underwent circumcision in order to qualify to do that. So it was, it was done, uh, but especially among women. Uh, the attraction to Judean ways, according to Josephus, was pretty huge in hmm. throughout Syria. So um, uh, the pushback that you're talking about, Derek, I think came came later. Um, 
uh, that is in the rabbinic in the early rabbinic period, uh, you have prohibitions against the Jews after the Bar Kokhba rebellion in 132 to 136 CE. You you have uh, Roman legislation against people becoming Judeans. And this would continue and become more intensive under Christianity. So once Christians came to power, they passed legislation forbidding Christians to become Jews. So this put an awful burden on the rabbinic leaders, the leaders of rabbinic Judaism, the rabbis. Uh, they did not want people to become Jews uh, because they did not want to be accused of you know, facilitating conversion to Judaism as it as it was in Christian times, so it became traditional in the in the late late antiquity, early Middle Ages, for rabbis to try to dissuade people uh, with every <laughs> everything they had. There's uh, so it, much here, Doctor. Really Wilson. put them off. Yeah, yeah. And, but in the modern period, with the rise of Reform Judaism in the 19th century, uh, Reform Judaism typically Threw, threw all that away and said, we're in a, a more enlightened time now. And hey, if people want to become Jews um, and they're serious about it, then we welcome them. Uh, so reform Judaism for a, a long period has actually welcomed converts. They don't go looking for them still. There's no proselytism. Uh, you, mostly, there, there was a book I read uh, actually a few years ago called Toward a Jewish America which was written by a reformed Jew who was quite open to the idea of, you know, more being more welcoming, more, more overtly welcoming. Uh, but most, you know, that's not traditional Judaism at all. Uh, but reformed Judaism would welcome them, wh whereas Orthodox Judaism would still keep the, the medieval thing of, you know, trying to dissuade people, hmm. but accepting them if they really, really, really persisted in, uh, in doing it. Yeah. Oh man, so many questions. I know if you're watching this, you probably have a million questions. So next super chat, because if not, I'll be stuck. Pet Mark, thank you so much. Uh, did the Jews, the Jew elites flirt with the possibility of independence from Rome, seeking alliances with other leaders of the region or with the Parthians? Uh, nice, nice question. This gets at um, <laughs> the, the causes of the Jewish war. Um, uh, so the simple model of the war against Rome was that Jews wanted freedom from em empire, right? So the simple model says, okay, empire is bad. Every empire is bad. The Roman Empire is bad. The British Empire is bad. The Soviet Empire is bad. Um, empires are bad. Um, clearly, the Jews must have hated being under Rome, so they wanted freedom. Then once you say, yeah, they want freedom, well, how can they be free? They're just a little, a little, you know, region un against the great Roman Empire. So the next proposal people would have is the one reflected in this question. Um, well, maybe they wanted to join up with the Parthian Empire and become a satellite. And there's, there, there's something to that. This is a complicated uh, issue because the Parthians had, in fact, invaded Syria in 40 BCE, and uh, take, they'd taken over Jerusalem. They had their own puppet king in Jerusalem. So when King Herod was appointed by the Romans, the king of Jerusalem in 40 BCE, it was a dead letter for the moment because there was another guy already there. And Herod had to go back with the help of Roman legions and besiege his own capital city in order to install himself as king. And so he only became king in 37 BC um, because it took a very long time. Well, he had to travel back to Judea, muster forces and all that. Uh, so there is um, kind of an abstract possibility. And in the, Ju in the Jewish war, the Judean war that is by Josephus, he makes a couple of references to people in Jerusalem writing to people in the Parthian Empire, seeking their help uh, in their uh, effort to um, fight off whatever they were doing, which I'll come back to in a second. Uh, so, so there is some, some evidence for the notion that 
people of Jerusalem wanted to, to, to link up with the Parthians. Uh, now, the problems with that. Um, Judea is in the highlands west of the Jordan River, right, with a little bit to the east called Perea over the Jordan River to the east. But all around that is the Decapolis to the north and the kingdom of Nabatea, the Nabataean Ar Arabian kingdom uh, to the east and all around the south. So there's not a straight connection between the Parthian world and Jerusalem. Uh, and all around Jerusalem in southern Syria are non-Judean cities like Gaza, Ascalon, Azotus, up, up the coast, and then the Decapolis, and Samaria to the north, which is extremely hostile to Judea, uh, and uh, Idumea to the south, which was, it, which was a kind of mixed bag. So it was no simple thing to simply hook up with Parthia first thing. Second, there's absolutely no evidence that Parthia was in the slightest bit interested in doing that and provoking Roman um, anger because the Parthians had just signed a big, big, big uh, agreement with Rome after many years of fighting. So they'd been fighting not over Judea recently uh, in, 60, in the 60s CE, that had been a century earlier when the Parthians had briefly invaded and then run home. Uh, they've been fighting over Armenia. Armenia in the north was a buffer state between, between the Roman and Parthian empires. And uh, it was a source of great you know, conflict and aggravation over the decades until they finally worked out an agreement. So, this great Roman general Corbulo had, you know, fought with the Parthians, and 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 been very tough, and so they worked out an agreement, and this was under Nero, where the Armenian king would go to Rome. And receive his diadem, his cloth around his head as king, from Nero, mm. right? So it was an elaborate kind of uh, ritual to show who's the boss in the region, and this had just happened in sixty six. Uh, CE, right? Just when the Judean War is breaking out, so there's absolutely no evidence, no reason to think that the Parthians, who had just managed to make nice with the Romans, just worked out this massive, expensive agreement with them, were were now going to turn and give their support to little Judea. That's the second thing. The third thing is, and I'll close with this: uh, the causes of the war. I think I wrote I wrote a big fat book on this subject. So, I, you know, um, I, can, can I pop it up and, and get your which book it is in particular? It's called so, the history of the Jewish war. OK, let me do this real quick here. Just yeah, to the one sure. on the top left there. This one. Yep, it's the right red. Here. Yeah, red covered one. Yeah. OK. All right. History. Yeah. I mean, it goes into maybe too much detail about the origins <laughs> and the course of the war. Uh, but anyhow. Um, it treats them as problems. It's not just arguing an idea. It's saying, you know, what was the what, what were the causes of the war, and works through them as historical problems. Um, so I, I think I think it's not plausible that this simple model was actually true. I don't think it's the case that the Jews were feeling terribly oppressed by a Roman Empire and demanding their freedom. I don't think that's correct at all um, because. Uh, the, Jerusalem prospered under Roman rule, as Josephus says in the opening of his war. He says, our city prospered more than any other city under Roman rule until this last disaster that happened in 66. So it was a series of events in 66. And here I agree with, it's not just me, I agree with a number of other scholars who think that there was not this kind of cork popping from tensions built up over like you know, 13 decades of uh, Roman rule, because the, the Jews had always been under, almost always been under Roman rule, under the Persians, under the Babylonians, under the Assyrians. Um, it's just, isn't, that wasn't new, right? So the idea that they couldn't tolerate foreign rule, and then after 130 years of Roman rule, um, suddenly exploded. Well, that's several generations. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense of the of the particular evidence, I think. 
So I'd rather um, understand the, the outbreak of the war as a result of specific incidents that happened under Nero um, in his particular situation. Nero was not Claudius. He was not Tiberius. He was not Augustus. He was, a, he was an eccentric um, young man uh, with his own issues and his needs and his financial needs and all of that and the great fire of Rome in 64 and his wanting to build the golden house um, ma magnificent uh, compound in Rome. All of that changed the scene, I think, and that's, that's why the war broke out. Hmm. So therefore, I don't think it was a matter of Jews demanding freedom and therefore looking to join the Parthian Empire in short. Wow. Thank you so much for that super chat and your wonderful uh, answer, Dr. Mason. Alan Bird, thank you for the super chat. Did Mithraic mysteries have any impact upon Judaism and early, upon early Christianity? Hmm. Well, that's, an, <laughs> that's another big one. Um, in, in the history of scholarship, the history of research, uh, it used to be uh, from the early 20th century, so the early 1900s onward, um, there was a big emphasis on the mystery religions as being the kind of explanatory key to, uh, to the origins of Christianity. So here was, the, here was the issue that those scholars were wrestling with. How do you get from Jesus, who was a Jewish teacher in Galilee, little villages and towns, how do you get from him uh, teaching, as people thought then mostly, uh, morality, do the right thing by your, by your neighbor, that kind of stuff? How do you get from that to Paul, especially, viewing Jesus as the dying and rising Savior whose blood atones for uh, humanity? Mm -hmm. And especially uh, the blood business in uh, Hebrews and um, and the Johannine text. Um, how do you how do you make that transition? Well, um, a bunch of scholars at the time were discovering a lot. They got really really interested in the mis the so called mystery religions. So the cult of Isis, the um, the uh, great mother uh, Kibale in Asia. And uh, yeah, Isis, uh, and Mithras, Mithraism, which this question is about. Uh, so the myth of uh, Mithras slaying the bull, and his blood, um, uh, his the 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 killing of the bull, creating all of uh, you know life and uh, good things, uh, and then there was in particular there was a ritual. Uh, that was associated with um, the great mother, uh, Kibale, uh, this ritual of the Tower Bolium, uh, which is the, uh, it's described in, in a couple of texts where uh, initiates would go into a, 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 a pit under which a, a bull, like above which, sorry, was a, a bull, uh, being uh, or or an animal being sacrificed, and the blood of that animal would would fall down on them and cleanse them somehow. So you can see that there was uh, an invitation here for scholars to say, "Aha! This is where all this stuff came from. Um, it's from the mystery religions," um, and that was like really big in scholarship for a couple of generations. The idea that Christianity was really not so Jewish. Uh, that is, so J Jesus was Jewish, his disciples were Jewish, but then along came Paul, along came these Gentiles who were much influenced by the, the so-called mystery religions, and then they twisted and imported all of this stuff into uh, the figure of Jesus and made him a dying and rising savior who cleansed the world through his blood. Okay, so that lasted, I think, until about the 1970s. Uh, yeah, others might differ on the dates, but it's, it's kind of passe now um, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, dating. So Mithraism is a good example. The, 
the cult of Mithras, which is an, initially a Persian cult that seeps its way into the uh, Roman world, the, the best evidence for the Mithras cult is from the later part of the first century onward into the second and third centuries. And it's best attested under uh, among Roman uh, soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, so they would join the cult and have a certain status and a rank within the, within the cult. It's not that well attested earlier and more generally. So it's not like it was, as far as we can tell, it's not like it was just extremely well known all around the Mediterranean at the time of Paul. Uh, so that's already, that's already a problem. And the, certainly the cult of Isis was, and Attis and Kibale in, uh, in um, Asia, Asia Minor was as well. They, they were known. Um, that's one set. So the dating, the dating issue is one side of it. The other side is that scholars generally now have come to focus much, much more on the varieties of Judaism, like uh, how, so using the terminology of Judaism, which I've already told you, I don't, I don't use that much, but say Judean culture, the varieties of being a Judean uh, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and their elaboration from the 1950s onward. And then, I mean, they're not into this kind of thing, uh, dying and rising savior, but it's a very different kind of way of being a Judean from what people had thought. It's much more apocalyptic, much more dualistic. It has, uh, these communities have traits that the Christians have. So people began to get queasy about saying, okay, this is Judaism. Jesus was within Judaism. And, and Paul, that's not Judaism anymore. That's something completely different. Nowadays, the prevailing view among scholars is that you, you shouldn't define what was Judean or what is Judaism so narrowly. There are lots of Judeans who were already influenced by their environment. Mm -hmm. And so when the Christians come along, it's not like Judaism is here and Christianity is going off over here. It's much more complicated and there. There are different types of Jude Judean uh, worship and culture that Christians are picking up on. And it's all complicated with different outside influences. So it's, I, I, that's, uh, that's the best I can do in a relatively short time. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a great, great question. And I've thought that too, like the impact of Gentiles coming in brought their baggage with them, this and that. But then you start to find these, these, if I could use it, uh, there's, we found archeological findings, if you will, with symbols or the names of Yahweh and Zeus. And that, that that's, it's the same name or like they're trying to find a way to harmonize or syncretize. If I could use the term uh, the the finding insider outsider or what we find in late second century rabbis, where there's binary distinction between Jew and Gentile, you, you might as well cross that out because there's a yeah. blur. It seems like it's very gray and not black and white. So yeah, there's a lot here. Uh, I think we don't know because we just don't have the best evidence for this gets into the whole God fear thing. There's all sorts of stuff to kind of wrap our heads around. And um, also, what, what scriptures did they use? Because I hear there's quotes from the New Testament, and we look back and we go, did they make that up? Uh, because yeah. we don't know where that's at. We don't have that in our Septuagint, or we don't have yeah. that in our Hebrew Bible that we have today. So wh where is it? So There's even a quotation in uh, 1 Corinthians, you know, no ear has heard, no eye has seen what God has in store. Um, that's uh, that's not attested in the Bible, but it's, it's in uh, the Coptic Gospel of Thomas. Um, it seems that, um, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a very interesting parallel there. So yeah, the, all, all of these questions, and not only that, even among texts we have known about for 2000 years, look at Philo of Alexandria. This is a very committed Judean teacher who loves the laws of Moses and who spends all his time, you know, interpreting the laws of Moses, but he's a very fluid uh, and fluent Greek thinker and speaker who attends, he seems to have Alexandrian citizenship, who attends the theater and the games. He makes references to like wrestling styles and things like that uh, from the games and, and the theater. And he knows all about 
Ju uh, uh, Greco-Roman culture and philosophy, which he fully integrates. Right. Um, so here's another case where he seems to be a precursor of Christians. You know, he talks about the Logos, for example, you know, as uh, in the, some kind of stoic way as a manifestation of God. Well, that's, I mean, that Chris, that's why Christians preserved his writings, because they were so congenial to Christianity. But he's a totally committed Judean yeah. um, and not a Christian at all. I, so, I did want to make one mention, too, just before we get to other super chats, is Paul in Philippians makes this analogy to the races and getting your read. Uh, seems like Paul might have been into the sports, at least observing. So I don't know. It's just yeah, yeah, it's something yeah. to question. Yeah. So I love I love this stuff. This is, makes you kind of wonder, what do we not know? What are we missing? We're missing pretty much everything, I think, <laughs> <laughs> is the short answer. <laughs> Alan Bird, great question. Rock on. Thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. Doc Pleroma, thank you again for the super chat. Good to see you here. Early Jewish prayers are marked by their interpretive engagement with Torah. Same spiritualization concept with the passion narratives? Ah, I'm not precisely sure of the, the direction of the question, but to the extent I understand it, uh, I would say uh, yes. But here's what, what I mean by that. and We'll, we'll see if the questioner um, was intending this. When you when you read the passion narratives, they seem at times to be constructed out of biblical texts. So everything from uh, you know that they, they 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 divided his garments. That's there's a scripture citation. The uh, Jesus on the cross, quoting uh, the twenty second Psalm, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" Um, everything, not everything, but a lot of elements of the of, of the story seem to be shaped by the Bible um, in some way. Uh, if that's the question, then yes, I would agree with that, especially in Matthew's version, because he he really likes to stop and say this was done to fulfill what was spoken by the scripture. Um, so he, he famously even has, you know, you, you know this, Derek, and many of your viewers will as well, he even famously as Jesus riding into Jerusalem on two donkeys uh, because of the synonymous parallelism in the biblical text, riding on an ass and the foal of an ass, yeah. um, as if they're two different animals. So you have paintings of Jesus, you know, sitting on a bigger uh, donkey and resting his feet on the lower one or... Because it's impossible to to imagine him like a rodeo, yeah. you know, rider with his, you know, standing standing on two saddles or something like that. It's a bizarre image, but Mark only has one animal, um, but then Matthew turns it into two. But what that shows you is the willingness to change the story in order to fit the scripture. Um, wow, and that's that's quite amazing that these writers were willing to do that. And you can see it right before your eyes that uh, Matthew changes Mark uh, just in order to fulfill the scripture. Someone needs to clip that right there. That That is golden. Thank you so much. I appreciate you responding. And Doc, thanks for the super chat. Kevin Doney, thank you for the super chat. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name properly. Derek, thanks for everything you do. Love the podcast and all the content you offer. Here is my tithing to the <laughs> Lambertian church <laughs> humana shamana thank you so much i appreciate it my friend um uh, yeah thank you for the gift here especially in the holidays i do appreciate all the help i can get and uh, keep doing what i'm doing so kevin thank you i appreciate the kind words and uh you know you're going to heaven don't worry kevin i'll make sure that when you get to the gates you have nothing to worry about my friend i appreciate it uh, Melody Joy, thank you for the super sticker, sweetheart. I appreciate you. Thank you for always being in the chat. I always imagine you with pom poms, just two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? You know, I just, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Let's see, I'm rolling down here to, I'm jumping to super chats because those are what help keep the lights on. And then if we run out, of course, I'll go to any questions. But I do appreciate that. Brute Facts Podcast, man. Thank you so much, Eddie. If you don't know Eddie, Eddie has a YouTube channel as well. 
please go subscribe to him. I'm going to pull it up here and uh, comment this here in the chat for everybody so you can subscribe to my friend Eddie. He is a Christian buddy of mine who is more into philosophy, but the guy is like a real sincere person. And I highly recommend you go show support to Brute Facts. And I'm going to even interviews mostly skeptics, to be honest with you. It's really a fascinating thing. So I'm putting his YouTube in the chat to show support to my friend here, Eddie. Just commented that. And uh, yeah, anyway, I've been interviewed by him a couple times on there. He has Dr. Price, Graham Oppie, Richard Carrier, different people, uh, but he's growing his channel. Let's go support him and help him get above a thousand subscribers if we can. Thank you so much, Eddie, for that super chat. I figured the least I could do is plug for you, man. Let everybody know about your channel. Moving on, uh, looking for the color here in the super chats. Doc is back and he says, speaking of wars, how did Jewish and Christians react to the Bar Kokhba revolt? Did this act as a catalyst for a demarcation between the two? Hmm. Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, it didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't help. Uh, there's a tradition. Uh, there's a there's a story in later texts that already in the first war against Rome, the Christians fled uh, from the city. So the, that would be Jewish Christians, Jewish followers of Jesus in Jerusalem, as things were, as the British say, hotting up. Um, we would say heating up uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, the the Christians fled to Pella. Pella was one of the Decapolis cities. Um, so that, that's a fairly early tradition, widely doubted um, in, by historians, but it's there. Uh, the Bar Kokhba revolt uh, seems to suggest, the, the, we have, the thing is with, th with that, we have very fragmentary evidence and it's really disputed, almost every piece of it, because um, we just have little bits in uh, Cassius Dio and Eusebius um, uh, little bits and snatches of information. Uh, nothing, we don't have a Josephus who writes a Jewish war about the Bar Kokhba revolt. So a couple of really good books have appeared about it just in the past uh, few years, really, really analyzing the evidence very carefully. Um, so I, I'm just going to say on that, um, uh, this, that I think it's a, in, uh, most many many scholars would disagree with me here. Many historians would disagree with me. There's this whole discussion of the parting of the ways in 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 my field, and I'm puzzled by it. Um, I'm just really puzzled by it because, as far as I can see, the the bulk of the earlier followers of Christ were never Jews to begin with. Uh, so all the people that Paul brought over to follow Christ from Ephesus, from Corinth, from Athens, from all these places, Philippi, were, were not Jews, right? And his announcement, his, uh, his uh, what's usually rendered gospel, his euangelion, uh, was all about just waiting for Christ to return from heaven and you'll be caught up. He didn't teach them to follow Torah or right. you know, observe the Jewish calendar or be circumcised, quite the opposite. If they were inclined that way, he got really upset. <laughs> so they were never Jews. So there was there was no way to part from. It's not like, yeah, I just I'm just baffled by it. But in in response to one of the recent questions we had, this movement in scholarship has been decidedly to include everything under the category of Judaism, so that even Paul's converts who were Gentiles are somehow honorary Jews in this model. And therefore, uh, people want to talk about, well, when did the ways part? When did these two um, religions part? Or when did this one religion, Judaism, become two religions? And that's been a huge part of uh, scholarly discussion. You'll find many books and articles on the parting of the ways, and then one called the ways that never parted. and um, so, so most of the debate has been about, has not been in the direction I would go, which is to say they, they never parted because they never were together. Um, 
the, oh, wow. the prevailing view has been they were so closely together that it wasn't until like the fourth century that they really parted. Um, I just don't understand this in historical yeah. terms. Uh, but that is, you will find a lot of scholars who really want to include virtually all of early Christianity in some form of Judaism under the umbrella of Judaism. Let me ask you this to probe further into this, because you said something unique. From what I understand, Jews in the synagogues weren't having these Christians. They were probably brethren, according to a lot of people, what they make the argument. What? How, how do you... So you said they were never, uh, you know, from their start. How do you address that? I'm like, what... Maybe well, it's better not to address that. Maybe it's better to just ask you briefly to explain what yeah. you mean. So, yeah, let's take a concrete example. Take the town of uh, the city of Thessalonica in northern Greece, in the province of Macedonia, the, the Roman province of Macedonia. But it's a, it's not what we call Macedonia today. It's a, a, a Roman province in uh, mainland Greece. So the, the city of Thessalonica is right on a big harbor. It's a big trading city. Paul comes through there, he attracts some followers to Christ, and that's he writes his first letter to them. Now, in 1 Thessalonians, if you look at what he's saying to them, is simply, I was there, I left, I was worried that you weren't still waiting for Christ to return, so I sent Timothy back to find out whether you're holding strong. And they they sent Timothy back to Paul saying, yes, we're still we're still uh, waiting for Christ to return. But hey, what, what happens if some people die before he comes back? Well, you know, Bob over here is very sick. He might die. So uh, is, is, is he just not going to go to heaven? And Paul, and Paul responds uh, to their questions. Uh, it's coming soon. I don't know when. Uh, hang in there. Maintain your spiritual purity, especially sexual, so that you can be ready to go up into the clouds. None of this has anything to do with Jewish teaching. With So, so what, what we need to remember is that, and this is why I think Judaism and the idea of religion is, a, is misleading. Being a Judean was a whole way of life. It was a culture. You know, there was no default calendar in the ancient world. Every, every polis, every people followed its own calendar. The Judeans had their own calendar in which every seventh day was a day of rest. That was not the case in, you know, there were no weekends in Athens or, or Thessalonica or any other place. So these people didn't observe the Jewish calendar. They didn't take the weekend off or have a Sabbath. Um, they didn't eat kosher food. They ate their normal food, which, you know, when meat was slaughtered, it's always with some blood in it. Uh, but kosher food doesn't allow that. Kosher food doesn't allow you to eat seafood, pork, which was very much valued in the Roman world, um, and, and, and other kinds of food. So these are not Jews in any way. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, that when I say that they were never together, uh, it's because to be a Judean was to be part of a people in a place, right? A community that did certain things, that observed calendar, diet, uh, all kinds of, you know, daily practices of do you prayer. Think, I'm sorry yeah. to probe. I have to probe yeah. because this yeah. is yeah. interesting. Yeah. Do you think that the reason there's this confusion is because the the enemies, the other, there are other competing groups with Paul, and he's addressing this problem of circumcision. He's addressing these problems. Is that where you think the creeping in of Judean practices comes from, and therefore then? everyone starts painting this as if this was Judean to begin with and then becomes pagan, or if I could use the term, I'm using, that's a horrible term to use, uh, becomes Pauline in a sense where you have, uh, it's not really Judean to begin with. And he's addressing enemies who are actually Judean, trying to Judaize, if I can use the term, his yeah. people. So yeah. now you have a marriage taking place through conflict and they think this is somehow origins Rather than it being competing sex, who, who, who is who's they? When when you so, say that, who do you mean by they? I'm it depends. Uh, a lot of are, I'm saying are the scholars getting confused in this? In your opinion, oh, by seeing I think the I, enemies... I think that's, I think they 
I don't. I wouldn't be so um, uh, bold as to say. Right. They're, I'm just they're guessing. All, they're all confused, and I'm. I have clarity of uh, vision. Um, <laughs> In your that, ge estimation, is all I'm saying. Do you? Yeah, think yeah, yeah. That I get it. I get it. I get it. Um, I just want to be careful not to, uh, to give the impression that uh, I know the truth here, and all my colleagues are, you know scratching around in darkness. Um, no, I, I think that, so I, I wouldn't want to say they're confused. I think that they are working with a different set of assumptions and a different paradigm. So, so again, the way it used to be was say from the enlightenment onward. So, well, let's, let's go right back okay. in, in, or in normal Christian, like mainstream Christianity through the Christian society, through the reformation, through the Counter-Reformation, through the Middle Ages, let's say very, very, very roughly, there's a unified picture, right? Jesus was the Son of God, came down from heaven, was incarnated. He taught these things uh, to his people uh, who followed him, and there was a continuity. His apostles became the foundation of the church. The church went on. It happened to then break out from its Jewish origin to encompass the whole world, right? Mm -hmm. So that it was a unified picture. So what happens with the Enlightenment, with people like uh, Voltaire and Thomas Paine and, and a whole bunch of others, uh, Edward Gibbon and many others, you start to get distinctions being made because these guys are beginning to look very critically at early Christian sources. And they say, you know what, like Tom Paine in his Age of Reason says, okay, Jesus, he's a nice guy. Or, or uh, Thomas Jefferson, right, the American president. Jesus was a Jew, and that's good. And we understand him. He fits within his Jewish environment. He just taught a, they, they, they might have been a little bit anti-Semitic, some of them. Uh, I don't think it's that clear, but maybe a little bit uh, jaundiced toward Judaism. So at least they thought, okay, Jesus taught a kind of pure Judaism, a very simple one, take care of your brother, sister, uh, love each other, you know, watch out for the poor and that kind of stuff. Um, Paul, however, just looks weird then on that on that scheme. So this was a modern scholarly construction, right, to to break out Paul. But it wasn't just New Testament specialists. It was any critically thinking person like Thomas Jefferson, Tom Paine, these guys saying, Paul, now he's he's weird. You know, he's He's not within Judaism. Mm -hmm. Then you had the origin of the so-called um, history of religion school of scholarship in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, which said, okay, we think we can explain Paul now in light of the mystery religions. Then, especially after the Second World War, and I think this has something to do quite understandably with the Holocaust and with the, because be, before the war, you, you reached a, a you reach the height of antagonism between Judaism and Christianity. And the leaders of New Testament scholarship at the time were German, as it happens. And many of them were driving a very sharp wedge mm -hmm. between Judaism and Christianity. Judaism, they, they called it late Judaism, meaning it was about to die <laughs> um, oh, wow. at the time of Jesus. They even had like a one word term for it, spate judentum. It was, a, it was like a decrepit form of prophetic Judaism that had kind of withered. And the Pharisees were held to be the prime representatives of this very legalistic, petty-minded, empty, arid uh, kind of religion. And then you contrast that with the shining light of, uh, of Christianity, which is spiritual and all that. So this was up until the Second World War, this was quite potent. And you had, it was almost a return to Marcion in the ancient world, uh, almost a rejection in some cases of the Old Testament as being too Jewish. Um, so a break from Christian orthodoxy that way. So what I'm trying to say is, I think that after the Second World War, there was an, a whole lot of soul searching to do, even among scholars, you know, uh, because a, a few scholars, uh, German scholars, had actually aligned themselves with the Nazi movement uh, and thought that their kind of anti-Judaism 
was in keeping with the anti-Judaism of the Nazis. I mean, there were a, a few notorious cases uh, of that. So after the Second World War, there was like a serious reckoning uh, to be had. What is there in our understanding of the New Testament and Christianity that would allow the Holocaust to happen? And you have books like um, Rosemary Radford Ruther's, um, um, oh gosh, what's it called now? The, the name escapes me. Ah, uh, uh, it's just gone from the tip of my tongue. Mm. Oh, faith, faith and fratricide, faith and fratricide, and and this is like an expose of saying there are there are roots that go right back to the origins of Christianity here, that are inimical to dialogue with Jews that already push Jews away and say Judaism ended, right? So Paul in Galatians three, the law was until Christ came. And that's it. So, so uh, um, Gregory Baum wrote an introduction to uh, Ruther's book, saying, you know, we ha we Christians have to do better. We have to rethink all this stuff. Like we really have to do some soul searching. At the same time, in the Catholic world, in the 1960s, Vatican II, and the proclamation um, called "In Our Time," Nostra Aetate, um, asked forgiveness. You know of of the Jews for what had happened and opened a new dialogue, the Cardinal Bea Center and all of that, a new dialogue between Jews and Christians. This is a very long answer, Derek, but no, I love this. This is I, what I, what I'm trying to say is I think there are very powerful and understandable and admirable uh, reasons why this idea of, of no, no, there's no opposition between Paul and Judaism. Actually. So it's reactionary in, in, in the other direction. It's yeah. almost overcompensating because it's being politically correct and yeah. not being necessarily, and I'm not trying to pit you there. I'm just saying in your best guess, because we can only guess based on the data we have, yeah. is this is a politically correct way of trying to justify Paul within Judaism when really, in fact, it your if you didn't have what happened in Nazi Germany, if you didn't have what happened through history against the Jews, and we could just say what we think and not have to worry about that because I know everyone's trying to keep that factored in, you would say Paul was not under that umbrella at all, technically. Well, I, I wouldn't quite put it like that. Uh, the, okay. parts that the parts that I would want to rephrase myself in my okay, own please. language um, would be, I don't quite think politically correct for, for me is a little bit of a cheaper term. Okay. Uh, it's a little, I mean, it has, it has validity. Oh no, don't say that. You know, I, that, that offends me, something like that. It's a, it's a bit more at the surface level. I don't okay. like that term. Um, this for me, I think the Holocaust is just, it's, it's just a stunning fact of European history. You know, I live in Europe now, where are all the Jews? Um, in the town I live in, in Groningen, there used to, in Groningen, there used to be um, 3,000 or more Jews who were simply killed in the Holocaust. And the street just down the road from me here was the main street. There's a big synagogue there, which now struggles to find 10 people. Uh, it was turned by the Nazis into a laundry. I mean, we're, I'm living in a place that the Nazis occupied. My faculty was the former courtroom where uh, where trials were held under Nazi judges. Um, in some ways, you might say, well, burn the place down and rebuild it. But, it, you know, it's a historic building that was there long before the Nazis came along. Um, so in Europe, I think you really feel this more, that this is like a really, really fundamental question for modern civilization. You know, how could this happen? So I... I get what you're saying, and I get why you're phrasing it that way. And I'm not criticizing you, Derek, but I would just say from my perspective, I wouldn't want to say it's just a matter of political correctness. It's a, it's, it's a very serious issue uh, in the whole understanding of how Western civilization has developed. You know, um, uh, this, this antagonism between Jews and Christians has always been there in some way. 
Um, so what I would say is uh, historically, this was understood by by Jewish scholars, uh, Kaufman Kola, uh, these these uh, members of the Reform Judaism and the uh, Science of Judaism. It was called uh, in the late 19th century. They looked at Paul and said, he, "He's not one of us. <laughs> you know, he's 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 doing something different that's just alien." And I would say simply, I I think they were quite justified to say that that Paul. Uh, my own teacher, E.P. Sanders, you know, said that Paul um, had no problem with Judean law and culture until he had this mystical experience with Christ. And then he simply packed it all in and said, this is what matters, you know, following Christ. It's just something completely different from mm. uh, observing Judean law. So that's that's how I would that's how I prefer to frame it. I would love to do an episode with you if you don't mind. Uh, of course, I know you're a busy man, but I would love to do an episode specifically just literally spending the time uh, talking about Paul because this yeah. is the million, billion, trillion dollar question, if I could use the term. Uh, yeah. There's so much more here. I have, I have to get to everybody's super chats because I, I, this isn't a show about me. <laughs> I just There's so much more to to talk to you about and to speculate with you about and like wrestle together. I, I really appreciate your humbleness and your approach and everything. I think we have so much to learn from each other, but obviously you've read a lot more than I have and I want to pull that out. So uh, Vesper, thank you for the super chat. What role did Mandeans have in the history of Judea in relations to Jews and Christians? Good question. Thank you for the super chat. Yeah. Yeah. Mandeans. Um, they, yeah, I'm not an expert in the Mandeans, um, and part of the reason for that is the best evidence for them is is very late. Uh, so for those of you who may not know, I think most viewers probably know, the Mandeans were the people who made John the Baptist their um, their man. Right? He was their 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 founding figure, a uh, figure of reverence, and so they wrote. You know, they, they there's a book about John the Baptist, and they are very very curious, fascinating people. Um, I mean, just really interesting, especially if you're interested in John the Baptist and who this guy was, that he had such a, an independent uh, line of impact, you know, from, from Jesus. So the gospel writers, of course, are very concerned to reduce his role to that of the herald of Jesus. Um, but, but Josephus, talks about him completely independently. And what's really interesting, uh, a doctoral student that I've been supervising here in, uh, in Groningen um, is working on John the Baptist in the Quran, in the Quran, so Yahya in the, uh, in the Quran. Um, and, and it seems that the Quran is drawing from independent uh, traditions about the Baptist, but the Mandeans, the problem is the dating. It's not even clear that Mandean texts were around early enough for the Quran in the seventh century to use them. Uh, but I'm I'm no expert on this. I only pick up what I hear from experts. So that's all I can really say about it. That uh, they weren't they weren't around. Uh, the Mandeans were not around in the first three or four centuries of uh, early Christianity and Christian Jewish relations. Thank you so much, Vesper, for that super chat. Sorry for having you wait so long to get your uh, questions answered because I'm such a nerd. I want to know so much. I'm like, ah, tell me. Uh, Aram Guard, thank you for the super chat. Do we have writings of Jews and early Christians interpreting Daniel's 70 weeks prophecies or prophecy in different ways, especially the final kingdom? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a fascinating and famous uh, problem. There was a guy named Ferris, I think. Ferris, you might be able to find this. He wrote a dissertation on the interpretation of Daniel's 70 weeks um, in early Jewish and Christian literature. Uh, I'm thinking he wrote it on, at the University of Toronto. I'm not sure. I didn't know the guy. Um, but I, I read it in the library once uh, there. I, I think it might have been a Toronto dissertation. Anyhow, it's on, it, I'm, I'm pretty sure his name was F.E., like Ferris Wheel, 
F E double R I S um, on the interpretation of Daniel. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, um, you have Jewish interpretation, reinterpretation. Uh, you have, for example, in um, Second Esdras, well, Fourth Ezra, which is part of Second Esdras, a reinterpretation of Daniel. You have in the Book of Revelation a reinterpretation of Daniel. You have in uh, Hippolytus the first. Christian commentary in the second century is on Daniel. Hmm. Uh, and each time these writers are re and Josephus uh, are reinterpreting Daniel uh, because the original vision written at most scholars think the time of Antiochus IV, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, refers to the end kingdom coming right then, 165 BCE. So the, the, the image with uh, feet of clay is, you know, the last Hel Hellenist, the Seleucid kingdom. And there's a very detailed breakdown in Daniel 11 of the, uh, of the, uh, you know, Seleucid Ptolemaic relationship. So that's why people think that, but of course the end did not come. <laughs> the, the new kingdom did not arrive in 165 BCE. So it was constantly re, uh, if, if I can use, a word that I like just because it's so weird, uh, repristinated, uh, so made <laughs> pristine again, right? Uh, it was made fresh again uh, it with new meaning under the Romans and then, uh, you know, as Christianity grew. And so all the way until the present, um, I'm, I haven't been in North America living there for a decade. They're still reinterpreting. I'm guessing that yeah. if you tur turn on their TV on a Sunday morning, you'll find yeah. some evangelist reinterpreting Daniel to refer to now. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. 100%. And also just uh, a fun fact that I noticed is it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls sect. Uh, so, oh, yes. Or at yes. least a certain sect yes. of the... Yeah. So yes. they, they, they got it wrong. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Just wanted to mention that. I read that in uh, John J. Collins, uh, for those who are interested, uh, The Apocalyptic Imagination. Yeah. He, he, he gives a little source there. It's really fun to watch and see. I, I, I enjoy this stuff. I mean, it helped me kind of free myself from an extreme fundamentalism and realize, well, there's a there's a gray area. You know, you don't have yeah. to be all or nothing. Sure. You can kind of bash the literalist fundamentalist harm set, the harmful mindset. At the same time, you got to imagine that like these people were in, in a, it's almost like imagine Jews writing during the Holocaust, something like this. Wouldn't you want to have hope? Even if there wasn't any, you yeah. want to give people that. So yeah. uh, it's kind of put yourself in the shoes and, and, and that's what I try to do and recognize. Yeah, it didn't happen. These are the facts, but sometimes you got to tell people what they want to hear to try and help them, you know? Well, and maybe not even what they want to hear, but just to provide hope. I remember that, the, the, there was a commentary written on the book of Revelation by a, by a South African uh, scholar, Christian uh, minister and scholar of the New Testament under apartheid, right? So um, he, he's writing for the sake of hope, right? For, so he's reinterpreting the book of Revelation then to give hope to the black population under living under apartheid mm. and who's going to criticize that you know it's um you see what he's doing he's not claiming a big historical criticism he's really talking about the the hope that this text provides yeah kind of so like sometimes, uh, sometimes scholars cannot get their heads around this right historically yeah. minded scholars but it's almost like uh, when Martin Luther King Jr. starts to use Exodus language all the yeah, time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he's yeah. hoping for something like that to happen. But, yeah. you know, if we get too literal, of course, we could just be like, come on, that's silly. But no, yeah, yeah, put yeah. yourself in the shoes. I would want that if I were them, too. So, yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Smoke, thank you for the super chat. Is there anything behind the similarity between Muhammad's cave encounter and Augustine's Toleg? Hope I'm pronouncing Tole -lege. it. Tole -lege. Tole -lege story. Yeah. Take and read. Take and read, in a famous line in uh, Augustine's uh, autobiography. Um, you know, on this one, I'm just going to have to pass. Um, this is, I think, the first one. I thought this, I thought this moment would come much sooner. Uh, <laughs> when I just have to confess, absolute, utter, complete 
ignorance. Uh, so Augustine is already, yeah, I've read Augustine. He's at the, he's at the outer limit of my, uh, you know, fifth century is at the outer limit of my sort of competence. Um, but early Islam and Muhammad in the cave, forget about it. Um, I, I have had very close colleagues who work in these areas. I'm actually beginning to write a history of early Judaism, Christianity in Islam with, with a colleague who's an expert in early Islam. We will compare notes. Maybe after two years or so, I will have a better response. But right now, I have absolutely no idea. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Smoke. I know uh, there's a Cadman's Cave uh, connection by Dr. Sean Anthony, who's a leading expert in the historical Muhammad. And then also he delves into this like Cadman's Cave. And uh, he definitely thinks that there's a common source. I don't think he thinks that the Quran author whether it be Muhammad or whoever is directly taking from Cadman's cave, but that they have a common source from something earlier or surrounding there. So I don't know. Uh, it, there's definitely, I, how do I put this? I don't think it's magical. Right. So I definitely think that this is a common powerful narrative that someone is using and uh, just knowing exactly what it is. Even the experts are like, we're not sure if it's, I don't think it's Cadman's cave, but it's coming from something earlier that Cadman's cave might be using, or they have a common source or something like that. That's all I know. Well, even though I don't know anything about the subject, I'm going to make a, one other comment, um, which is this, that uh, two comments. You may have heard the idea that there are only really like four, four narratives or five narratives. People say it differently. I get all the Hollywood films you watch, you know, um, there, it boils down to like four or five narratives. So that's that's one side of this. The other side of it is, therefore, when you see parallels, it's uh, it's one of the biggest, most frequently committed fallacies of historical work to turn parallels into genetic mm -hmm. uh, relationship. Um, and there are many, many, many examples of why that's just bad, you know, um, like take the Star of David. Uh, that's like it looks very much like the seal of Solomon, which is a, a traditional Muslim uh, symbol, the seal of Solomon uh, or some versions of the seal of Solomon. Is there a genetic relationship? Probably not. There may be, but you can't assume it uh, or, you know. Uh, you'll you'll see swastikas around um, in all kinds of ancient architecture, uh, and especially in India, it, there's it's a symbol, right? And there, there there is a kind of borrowing. The Nazis borrowed this Aryan symbol, but it doesn't have anything to do with the original. Um, so there, all the parallels are just complicated, mm -hmm. uh, and and they're not in most cases they're not genetic. But like this four, this four narrative thing or five narratives, I'm sure we've all seen many films. Maybe we didn't consciously process it, but the sort of underlying idea is sort of like the idea in the Odyssey. Here's part of the problem with finding, you know, Homer in, in the Gospels and so on, is because the, the, the root story of alienation, the hero returning home against all odds, this is something you see in like martial arts films from uh, Japan or China or Hong Kong all the time, right? Is that it's there's like this recurring theme of the, the, the hero who's, you know, whose woman is at home and, and is in danger and family's in danger. Or I don't know, a whole bunch of films from Hollywood as well have the same theme. You know, the guy's coming back, he's bouncing back and he's going to get revenge on the people who, you know, killed his brother or or have captured captured his family or whatever it's a it's like a very powerful root story so this idea of um there's a parallel and therefore there's a genetic relationship i would just be very skeptical the other thing i want to say is although i know nothing about the field um i've been around it enough to know that quran scholarship is all over the place on mm -hmm. uh, where these traditions come from so I'd be, I'd just be really, really careful about trying to. If you to want to keep your head, just say Gabriel. 
gave it to him. <laughs> No, um, interesting questions we could rabbit trail into. I'd love to get your thoughts further. I don't know if you how much you've read of Dennis McDonald's work, but uh, ultimately to learn Greek, you would read Homer. So there seems to be, even if he doesn't, he, he admits that maybe this isn't genetic, maybe it's cultural, but he yeah. says, here's the problem. And I agree yeah. with him. And then we'll move to the next super chat is this. He says, okay, let's grant that none of this is genetic. Let's grant it's genetic through the culture, through the air in that sense. So it's not direct. I don't have Homer open and here's the gospel yeah, yeah. and here I am writing. Okay. He says, the problem is every commentary you read, everyone's ignoring it. Other than maybe if you read an ax, you're reading a, a Pervo or something, he's going to bring up Euripides or something like that. He's fantastic. The point is these gospel guys and, and girls who are commentating are literally only talking about Hebrew Bible. They're yeah. not pointing out, oh, by the way, it seems yeah. culturally there's a trope. And this seems like, especially if you're a Greek reader and author, you're probably, if, if we go with Robin Walsh's idea here, that these are someone well-educated, possibly elites, but definitely well-educated authors. They know these stories, and they may have been impacted by the culture, and they don't even mention, oh, by the way, yeah, he's quoting Jeremiah. Yeah, he's quoting uh, Exodus here. However, here seems to be an allusion to a Homeric motif or something like that. They don't even, they ignore it and they only stick to what's the Bible say about the Bible? That's yeah, the yeah, problem yeah, he's saying in yeah. the scholarship. So, yeah, that's, that's valid. But it's also the case that these things go in uh, pendulum swings. Mm -hmm. There was a time when Paul was read, for example, in some circles still is, very small circles, uh, in, against, only against like Stoic thought or you know platonic thought or something right. like that um so this move back toward paul within judaism is a, is a pendulum swing so yeah i i fully take uh, dennis mcdonald's point that's quite right it, because that's where scholarship is now it focuses on jewish background and um biblical background that's right yeah he thinks yeah. it's both uh, he doesn't yeah, yeah, think it's yeah, either yeah. or it's both it has it has to be both yeah yeah Thank you so much for that. And, oh, we have so much to talk about, Dr. Mason. Ben Holman, thank you for the super chat. Bar Kokhba's rebellion in 132 was 62 year after re revolt of 70. Daniel 9's 77's prophecy, 7 plus 62 plus 1 weeks. Any evidence Akiba or Bar Kokhba were reading Daniel 9? Uh, well, I, I would guess they were re they're reading it as part of the Bible. Um, there is a, 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 some scholars have raised the possibility that, so here's the question, what caused the Bar Kokhba rebellion? <laughs> uh, was it just a rebellion out of the blue? People said, you know, it's time, it's uh, so many years or weeks of years after 70, it's time to rebel. Or was there immediate, an immediate provocation um, I think a, a large portion of scholarship now thinks there was an immediate provocation that the building of uh, Ilia Capitolina and the temple to Jupiter uh, in Ilia Capitolina, thereby removing the possibility of rebuilding the Judean temple, uh, even if the temple mount was not used. Uh, for like so, even if the temple to Jupiter was where, say, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is uh, today, and and the Temple Mount was not part of Ilia Capitolina, that's a possibility. Maybe there was just a statue or something on that Temple Mount. Uh, even if that's the case, um, it it pretty much precluded because it was now a, a city named after Hadrian. It precluded uh, the rebuilding of the temple, and I think many most scholars now think that was the so the the problem is the problem is one of order did that did hadrian build the city ilia capitolina as a result of the bar Kokhba revolt or was it the cause and for various reasons now i think most scholars think it was the cause uh, in, so he began building the city maybe as early as 130 so he made a visit to the region ar around that time and that may be the impetus for building the city. Um, mm. So, uh, and we, I mean, there are various reasons for this. It has partly to do with the coin finds. Uh, what, what were the coins found with? 
it has partly to do with uh, I did a study once uh, measuring the the gates. We have a gate from uh, we, we actually have two uh, partial gateways from Ilia Capitolina uh, in modern Jerusalem, uh, and if you if you measure them against the the bays of the monumental gateway to um, uh, Jerash Geraza, where uh, which were built. With, there's an inscription saying they, that was built in honor of Hadrian's visit in 129.30. Uh, they're the same measurements. It's the same style. It's the same measurements. They could be superimposed. I, did, I have a little presentation where I superimpose one on the other. They're the same. It looks like, you know, that could be, it could be part of the same visit when the, the temple was being, to, to, um, to Jupiter was being built. So if that spurred the Bar Kokhba revolt, then it would simply be a matter of, like Daniel's weeks, it would just be a matter of kind of spiritual edification to say, oh, and this happened, you know, mm -hmm. after that. But the impetus to revolt would already be there, irrespective of Daniel. You don't need Daniel to say, this is outrageous. Um, we can't yeah. tolerate that. We're going to fight. Thank you so much. I appreciate your question, Ben. I hope you got it answered. Doc is back, and thank you for the super chat. How late is the second half of Daniel given the anachronistic Aramaic used, replacing Z with the letter D and the late Greek loan words? Hmm. <laughs> uh, by the way, we should really ask this question with the... Um, I've got a Jim Majors. He specifically got his PhD, wrote his dissertation in Daniel. But yeah. either way, uh, I, I definitely would love to get him on at some point to delve into Daniel deeper. But yeah. do you have any thoughts on you, this? You would do better getting him on uh, with this. Um, the the dating of Daniel is, you know, a big mess. Uh, the reason, so the basic insight is the one that Porphyry had way back in. Uh, in the third century, uh, that the story purports to be writing a prediction, but it purports to be written at a very sort of vague time through several reigns of uh, Babylonian Persian kings and then predicting the future. But strangely, it gets the early stuff wrong about when it's supposedly writing. And it gets the later stuff in great detail exactly right and then stops and says this is when you know the, the dead shall rise and become like the stars and so on like the new the new age becomes then this is when god intervenes so since porphyry um it's been known already that uh, for those willing to think this way historically that that's when it was written. It was written in 165 or so BC, but uh, that only means the kind of basic shell of the story of the the piling up of detail in, in chapters 10 and 11, especially. Um, that that explains that, but the linguistic elements um, and the earlier stories about you know Daniel in the lion's den and, and like the more moralizing stories um uh the fiery furnace and and all of that many scholars have argued those are really old uh those are old stories being recycled mm -hmm. why the switch from hebrew to aramaic um uh it's been variously explained and I'm not expert enough in the in the, in the Hebrew Bible, and it's uh, you know the whole history of tradition to be able to give you a good answer. Uh, Thank you. But I, I think I do think it's clear that Daniel was basically written, completed, made into a coherent uh, text then in 165, which doesn't rule out later revision, uh, and it doesn't rule out that it's using stories from two or 300 years earlier than that. One point I would make here is that, curiously, many of you will know, Daniel did not, the, the, the rabbis constructed the Bible as Torah, prophets, and writings. And the writings section was a mishmash of moralizing texts, you know, Proverbs, Job, 
um, sort of texts that teach lessons. But the prophets were prophets and Torah was Moses' first five books. Daniel in that scheme did not go in the prophets. Right? That's really quite interesting. Because uh, for Josephus, Daniel was the greatest prophet ever. He, he was so precise, apparently, in his predictions, as he thought, because he didn't know about Porphyry's analysis yet. But the, So what I'm getting at is I think the rabbis included Daniel, not because they wanted anybody reading Daniel for its predictions, but for the moralizing stories about the, the lion's den, the fiery furnace. Um, these are stories of, you know, uh um god's after, faithfulness and yeah stuff. heroic adherence to the law yeah 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 so oh. it, it makes me wonder about josephus how he was not cool with these rebels but he seemed to have an apocalyptic taste as well to some degree so it's really odd yeah, i wouldn't I say know. apocalyptic i would say um in his view i think it's, it has more to do with the turns of fortune okay that is to say now fortune is with the romans and we have to accept that that's uh, you can't fight against that uh you know god is with the romans right now but our day will come but i, I that's a little for me that's a little different from apocalyptic right apocalyptic right, right. is a much more dualistic kind of mentality and i don't think that's anywhere to be found in josephus thank you so much yeah. mitch maserol thank you for the chat can dr mason shed some light on josephus POW status, prisoner of war status after capture, was he technically enslaved at that point? And how did his status evolve over time with respect to his Roman captors? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, hey, are, we should probably wrap this up at some point, right? Um, yeah, we've got one, two, just to make sure, three super chats. So okay. Okay, that's all good. we got left after this. And uh, okay. yes, sir. Good. Yeah, here in here in the Netherlands, it's getting on for. Uh, I'm getting a little hungry. It's getting on for dinner time. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now this is this one is you know this is a, a fun question, very very interesting. So uh, the story is Josephus is in the in in Yotapata, this town Yodfat in Galilee, and the Romans come and besiege it. He had gone there to help uh, the, the the townspeople. He didn't have to be there. He was in a place of safety by the lake of uh, Tiberius, so in the town of Tiberius, which was not on the Roman war path at all because it belonged to King Agrippa II, who was an ally of the Romans at this point. So they weren't going to go and destroy Tiberius. They were headed to Jerusalem. But they were going to destroy this little town in central Galilee called Yotapata. So Josephus, unlike his reputation, his reputation is for being a turncoat or a coward or something like that. I think that's absurd. He's the, actually the only guy we know about who left a place of safety in the war to go and put himself in harm's way, to run toward the shooting, as it were. Um, but but he, he probably didn't want to stay till the end. He probably wanted to try to negotiate something with the Romans because he's a member of the elite class from Jerusalem. He'd already made a trip to Rome. Uh, to negotiate with Nero and Nero's wife, Papia Sabina, for the release of some Judean priests. And he'd succeeded through the, through the wife more than with Nero, apparently. Uh, but he brought the guys home. Uh, so he was probably pretty confident that he might have a shot at sparing this city. And when it didn't work, he says he wanted to leave. He didn't want to stay there and die. Um, when, when he saw that there was no chance, he tried to leave. But the, the populace kept him there. So anyway, he's there when the Romans overrun the town. And finally, he, uh, he, he surrenders uh, to them rather than take his own life in the cave with the others. And he goes to Vespasian. And he says, so Vespasian, uh, it, the, the Romans are about to kill him as soon as they. So Vespasian, according to his story, had said to him, Josephus, come out wherever you are, you know, come out. He had a, an emissary go around guy named Nicanor go around and say, Josephus, come out. Uh, Vespasian wants to meet you. He thinks you're the greatest general. And Josephus says, I knew this was all crap, right? I, um, I, I knew they just wanted to kill me. It was just a lure to get me out. So I didn't want to get out. But then I thought, okay, well, what am I going to do? I don't want to kill myself here in the cave. So and, and he trusted himself to God, he says. I thought God would protect me. So he goes into the Roman camp. 
And sure enough, they want to kill him as soon as they see him because he's an enemy, a uh, captured enemy. And he says that Titus, who was two years younger than Josephus, Josephus only 30 years old, Titus was 28, saw Josephus and took pity on him. And he pleaded with his father to save his life. That's what Josephus says. Uh, so, in fact, this patient was a liar. He was a dirty, rotten liar who just wanted him out so he could have him killed. But Titus intervened and saved his life. That's the story. Then he says, Vespasian said, okay, fine, all right, but I'm going to send you to Nero because Nero is still the emperor and he's the emperor that Vespasian's working for. I'm going to send you to Nero as a, as a prisoner. Nero can do what, what he wants with you. Josephus, he attributes this brain, uh, bright spark to God helping him. He says, uh, I thought of it this way. I said, well, Vespasian, look, why do you want to send me to him, All right, this young artist, a feet, a feet artist in Rome? Why do you want me to send me to him? You're the real emperor. You're the real Caesar. So now imagine this. Vespasian is a hardened battle commander, tough guy. You know, he's been in lots of wars before. He's got a reputation as a tough commander, 56 years old. And he's going to send Josephus on the perilous ship journey to Rome, Josephus has absolutely no interest. He already, on his first trip to Rome, his ship sank and he nearly died and many of the passengers died. So he really doesn't want to repeat this as a prisoner going to Nero. So he's using every uh, resource to say, no, keep me as your prisoner. You're the real emperor, right? Now this is treason talk if it were coming mm -hmm. from a Roman. If a Roman were to say that, uh, that would be grounds for execution for rebellion, right, against the against the emperor. Um, but Vespasian just says, well, I think you're trying to save your life. This is nonsense, and throws him in chains. Now, according to the story, which is the only story we have, and there's no reason to disbelieve it because Josephus told it in Rome among those people who knew, this, knew the truth, uh, he was in chains for two years. And then when Vespasian, so that happened in mid-67 CE, when Vespasian decided in mid-69 CE that he would in fact make a bid to become emperor because uh, Vitellius had become emperor and Vespasian thought, well, he was just a govern, he was just a commander in the western, uh, west of the empire in Spain and he's beaten, you know, his competitors, Otto, was the last one to become emperor. And Vespasian's thinking, hey, I'm, I'm a better emperor than he is. I've got an army of support here, mm -hmm. so I'm going to make a bid for, for emperor. So he restarts the civil war. And according to this story, he decides, uh, you know, this guy Josephus, who said to me two years ago, you're the real, you're the real guy. You're the real, the real deal. That could be useful for me. So he frees him from his chains and uh and uh, according to the story undergo he uses a ceremony which which is not attested anywhere else in roman literature he goes through a ceremony where he has an axe brought and and the chains are broken and this is supposed to symbolize that it's not like he's an ex prisoner an ex slave uh a freedman but he was never a slave so that this is wiped from the record as it were and Josephus is just restored to being a free man. So that's a basic summary wow. of, uh, of his stat how his status evolved. Then he accompanies, he's still forced to accompany Vespasian and then Titus. When Titus goes to the siege of Jerusalem, uh, Josephus is there as his, you know, he has no choice. Uh, he still has to be with them in the camp and uh, interpret for Titus and, and help him understand what uh, deserters from the Judean side are saying. And he says that in the Roman camp, his life was in danger all the time because the Roman soldiers thought he might be a disruptive element and they hated him anyway as an enemy fighter. So uh, they wanted him killed. But he says his life was spared and he eventually went off to Rome and wrote his, uh, his works there. So we can be glad, we can be glad he survived. Thank you so much, Mitch, for that super chat. And of course, Dr. Mason, wonderful response. 
the KD80, thank you so much. What was the demographic between uh, Jews and Greek Syrians in Judea province overall and in cities such as Caesarea? Yeah, okay, I'll try to I'll try to be quick with this because we can do it fairly sort of factually in a way. Uh, first point is that Judea was not a province, actually. It's in all the older textbooks, you will read that Judea was a province of, of Rome so that the war was between a, a province revolting against the, the empire. Um, but in the recent years, in the past 20 years or so, especially, um, it's become clear that was not the case. Judea was a region within the province of Syria. The problem, the problem to explain very briefly is that Josephus himself is the, is the culprit here. Because in his war, he says, in War II, 118, he says that uh, after Archelaus was removed, the, the son of King Herod uh, had ruled for 10 years. After that, Judea was made a province and a governor was sent out named Caponius. Okay, so that looks clear, right? And most handbooks based their view on that. Judea became a province, an independent province with its own governor. A later governor would be Pontius Pilate and so on. Uh, but the problem is that we always had Josephus Antiquities, which tells a much different story, which is more, much more complicated. And, uh, but it's also simpler in a way. So the, the story there is that the, Ju the, the Jerusalem leaders, the high priests, had always begged uh, the Roman officials not to be put under Herod's son, Archelaus but rather to be made part of the province of Syria, to be joined like all the rest of the surrounding area to the province of Syria and just be one city. You might say, why would they do that? Because Jerusalem would lose its status um, under Herod and under Archelaus. It was the ruling city of all the region around. And what these guys, the, the leaders in Jerusalem, the priestly leaders wanted was to lose that special status and just be joined to the province of Syria. I think the reason is that it heightened their own power. Um, if they had a monarch in charge of them, like Herod or his son, uh, yes, Jerusalem had status outside, but they inside the city were being crushed under Herod or Archelaus. So their bid was, please get rid of these guys, these tyrants, these monarchs, and let us be the natural rulers of our city but join us to the province of Syria and we'll be a regular city. And in, and in the Antiquities, that wish is finally granted by Augustus. So at the end of Antiquities 17, uh, the very last two sentences and the first two sentences repeated of Antiquities 18, Josephus says very, very clearly that Judea was joined, annexed to the province of Syria and it received this guy Caponius as first governor, but he is subordinate to the main governor of Syria, who was Quirinius. And that's why the census took place uh, in 6 C. That's when the census took place. That's why Judea was included in the census under Quirinius, because Quirinius is the legate of Syria, right? Um, if Judea had been an independent province, there it would not have been a part of the, the census under Quirinius because it wouldn't be in Quirinius province. So it's very clear actually now that scholars have studied this stuff more intensively. And I have a big section in it on it in that book that you showed on the, on the war. Judea is part of the province of Syria. So with that in mind, uh, so if we can say there was no Judean province, what was the demographic balance between Jews and Greeks and Syrians? in a place like Caesarea. So Judea is the, is the upland, the highland interior part of the south of Syria. All along the coast are cities that are much older than Jerusalem and are not Jewish. They're not Judean. So Gaza, Ascalon, Azotus. So that's like Gaza today, um, Ashkelon, Ashdod in Hebrew. Uh, going up the coast, Yopa, Yafo, uh, Caesarea, Dora, uh, Ptolemaeus. Most of these are not Judean at all. Uh, Yopa became Judean because of the Hasmoneans. They conquered it and made it a port 
So it became a Judean port, but the others are not Judean. Uh, and Caesarea, which was specifically asked about, it's estimated the population was about 20,000, 22,000 maybe. Uh, there is a significant Judean minority there. They are not citizens of Caesarea and they are not part of the, the ruling council. So the city of Caesarea is a Greco-Roman city. And that's clear because there's a temple to Augustus in Rome right, at, right in the center of the harbor, which has colossal statues uh, in it. So it's a very, and, it, and the place is filled with entertainment facilities, you know, big uh, theater, amphitheater, and all that. It's a Greco-Roman city. But the curious thing about Caesarea is that the Judean minority is relatively wealthy. So the majority population is not as wealthy there, the Greco-Syrian population. And that and they are the basis, they are part of the basis of the auxiliary army. Uh, so that's the level, that's the social level they're at. They're traders, they're, they work in the docks and things like that. Uh, but the Judeans who are there are uh, dealing in import-export, apparently, it seems, with because they're in the port. And they're bringing in stuff for the Jewish world that will go, go to Judea. So they launch a bid to try to have the city remade, re, uh, sort of rechartered as, as a Judean city. Mm. Uh, and they appeal to Nero uh, for that privilege. And he turns them down and says, no, it will remain a Greco-Roman uh, city. And according to Josephus, that decision was one of the foundations of the war when Judeans realized that they were losing their imperial protection and support uh, from Nero. And he was turning against them because the previous emperors had been like, especially Augustus, Tiberius and Claudius had been very supportive of uh, Jerusalem and Judeans. So. <laughs> wow. There's so much to know. Thank you so much for that super chat and your response. Two more, and then we're letting him go eat, because if we don't, he's not going to make it to ever do this again with me. Uh, Aram Guard says, did Jesus believe he was Daniel's son of man, or perhaps preparing the way for him? Or is the son of man connection something Mark came up with? Wow, wow, wow. This is, this is another question. Uh, these questions are all extremely Shows sharp, in themselves. Sharp. <laughs> and sharp and, and rich. Um, this is another one that opens up a whole, a whole like subdiscipline of scholarship. There are several <laughs> books and articles written on the Son of Man problem, so it's really complicated. So let's take, let's try to keep it simple. In in Daniel seven, you have this image right of these different uh, beasts. Uh, and then the, the, the last image in Daniel 7, 13, the guy says, the, the, the seer, the visionary says, and I saw uh, 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 an image like a son of man, right? So um, Ben Adam in Hebrew, Baranasha in Aramaic, uh, a son of man. What does that mean? It probably just means a human being. So the others were grotesque beasts and figures. And uh, in, in Hebrew, it's an idiomatic thing that you use the term son of uh, just to mean someone who has that characteristic. So in the Gospels, I don't know, some of your uh, readers will know there are this, uh, well, Barnabas in, not in, in um, the Gospels, but in Acts, is a son of consolation, right? That means he's a consoling person. Uh, or that's what his name means, or the sons of thunder in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. um, there, it's some kind of a characteristic. So in, in the Psalms, in Psalm 8, I think in verse 4, somewhere around there, we have this famous line, you know, what is, what is man that you are mindful of him, O God? What is the son of man that you, that you visit him? It's, it's not meaning anything different from man. Uh, it's just a synonymous parallelism. Son of man just means man, a human being. You yeah. son of man is like you son of iniquity. You um, son of, well, you can you think mortal, of- You mortal, you mortal. Yeah, exactly. You mortal. Right. So it so to keep it simple, it just seems to be that. But 
But in later sort of so-called apocalyptic literature, this idea of the son of man of Daniel was expanded and taken to mean uh, some sort of heavenly figure. Now in Daniel, the son, this human, this mortal is going upwards. He's going up in the clouds to God. But in some later literature, he's in the clouds, so he's coming down. Like he's some, he, he gets somehow, in some cases, it's all very fuzzy, but somehow is associated with some kind of messianic anointed figure, something like that. Now, problem in the Gospels is, you have some passage, like, so the pro basic problem in the Gospels is Jesus refers to a son of man. Um, but sometimes, in some passages, it's clear that it means a mortal, right? Um, because in some versions of that saying about the Sabbath, for example, man was made for the, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. In some versions of that, it's the son of man, right, is Lord of the Sabbath. Right. That well, okay. That just means human beings are masters of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for them, right. not not reversed. But then you have a few passages, like we're in uh, Mark eight. You you will see the Son of Man coming. So is Jesus referring to himself, or is he referring to someone else? You have a uh, uh, one big contributor to this discussion was Geza Ramesh. Uh, who, who wrote a book on Jesus the Jew, and he argued that this is all just perfectly normal language. So it's, it's, there's, he found lots of examples where this term bar and asha, the son of man, was, a, it was a, a, a way of not talking about yourself in a, in a situation of gravity. You don't just say I, you say, you know, you beat around the bush, you use a euphemism. I've been do, doing some stuff with a Polish university, and when uh, when the Polish people write to me in English, they say, "Would the professor please do this?" And when I first read it, I thought, "Who are they talking about? Am I supposed to ask somebody, some professor, to, like who, are, <laughs> who do they mean?" And then it dawned on me, I'm, I can be a little slow sometimes. It dawned on me from the context that um, they're talking about me. But they would have considered it rude. I guess in Polish, it would be rude to say, would you do this? That would sound somehow too direct. So would the professor do this? Ah, okay. And it's something like that, right? You, it's, too, it's too rude in a, in a situation of gravity just to say, I will do this. So you refer to yourself obliquely as, you know, bar and asha, the, the, son, uh, son, the son of man, the a mortal uh, human being. But that's just the kind of that's to sketch the contours of the of the debate. Then there are texts, clearly uh, other apocalyptic texts, that seem to view the Son of Man as a heavenly being of some kind. And so this is the problem in the Gospels. And uh, I don't know. So the, the really short answer to your question, which could have saved us all a lot of time, is I, I don't know. But anyway, I thought it might be used for me. History's, you know, the journey is the destination. Uh, like there's much that we don't know for sure, but what we do know, what we can look at, is the evidence. So for me, the discussion of the evidence, the analysis of evidence, is the doing of history. Um, getting to a firm conclusion, well, most of the time we don't know. I think. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for that super chat. I really appreciate that final super chat. And then I got to let him go eat. Um, and, and, and I plan to do this again with you. Of course, you know that we'll, we'll stay in contact and I'll, I'll we'll figure out something next. Uh, stop scamming, man. Thank you for the super chat. Thank you for everybody watching. Uh, I saw a documentary with an attempt to find a cash mint, a cachet mentioned in the copper scroll it resulted yeah. in a find including small shovels and a is that a palm a psalm fragment yeah. i don't suppose you know anything about it um i'm not sure how uh, it's connected to whether this is connected to the copper scroll or not so the copper scroll for anyone who doesn't know i'm sure most of you know by now is this very special scroll um that uh in uh, cave three it was found 
It's now in the Amman Museum in, in Jordan. Um, an amazing scroll. It just describes places of hidden treasures. Um, but it doesn't really describe them. <laughs> like it's, you know, uh, beside, the, be, be, beside that hill. And uh, <laughs> like nobody's been able to find them. So, yeah, it's, it's quite possible. I mean, people have been looking ever since this scroll was published and nobody's really found anything. So what your questioner is saying is there was a documentary, which I haven't seen, which said that that search yielded uh, some find of some small shovels, shovels and a, a psalm fragment. Um, uh, I don't think I know. Uh, well, I, I definitely don't know. I don't think I can remember anything related to that. So I don't know the documentary for sure. Um, yeah. And I don't know that. No. It says uh, it, it's believed they may be in incense, incense, shovels. incense shovels. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, in uh, 2017 was found. So there, there are 11 caves in which uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were found. The Qumran Scrolls were found. And then in 2017, I think there was a 12th cave. And I can't honestly remember what was found in there. Uh, well, I know some of the things. There were, there were, there were um, modern 1950s, 60s era pickaxe, um, pickaxes. And there were some scroll jars that were broken. And so this is really interesting. So no scrolls were actually found there. But what's really, this is a little bit of a di diversion from the question. So I guess that's not the cave that, that is in question here because no scroll was found there. But the reason that it's included uh, as cave 12 among the scroll finds is that it looks now, it, it, sh it re raises really troubling questions actually about the original finding of the scrolls because those are reliant, those stories about how the scrolls were found were reliant on the oral traditions they turned up on the antiquities market. And then the people who sold them related these stories about how they were found. Scholars have often doubted that these were the true stories um, for good reason. But it looks like here that maybe these, these scrolls were found in this cave, uh, cave 12, like scroll jars were found and smashed open and scrolls taken out Hmm. and put on the antiquities market from this cave, which had previously been unknown uh, before uh, 2017. So <laughs> lots and lots of questions. Um, I'm not a scroll scholar. Scrolls, I mean, that may sound like uh, I should be somehow a scroll scholar. I've taught, taught the Dead Sea Scrolls. I studied the Dead Sea Scrolls in university in my doctoral program. But, you know, you have to choose the way you go. And the scrolls have become like a career choice for many scholars. Qumran and the scrolls becomes like much of what they do. The way that I kind of focus on Josephus and Roman Judea um, and historiography and issues I've chosen to focus on, others really focus on the scrolls and in relation to the Bible and biblical texts and all of that. It's just not the way that I went. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry to say that I... Uh, I'm, uh, I don't have up to the minute um, knowledge of that. Thank you so much, Dr. Mason. All of you in the chat, thank you for the positive uplift. When I'm down and I'm just, I can come here and hang out with you. You make it, you make it great. And their questions are really good questions, Dr. Yep. Mason. You did fantastic. I have so many more questions. That's how you know we're on to something. When you have more questions than answer, answers, is like it makes me want to have you come back. So I want everybody. While you're here, go check out the Patreon. I've got tons, endless content. I mean that probably three, 400 videos that have not made it onto YouTube that I have on here. You can help support us in that way. Also, there's videos I haven't released with some big YouTuber names and stuff. This one won't be out till January. You can watch early if you want to get into Quranic experts on there on the scrolls and just like, you know, from Uthman and, and the four, uh, the four, if you will, foundational text of the Quran, is it really consistent? And, and what are the experts saying? So go check it out. Help support us there. Get the books here on Amazon for Dr. Mason. He's written a lot on this. 
I mean, he is one of the most meticulous meth methodological scholars that I know in this field that talk about these things and is willing to present it to a broader audience. I hope you go and get the books. This is the one that we've been constantly going back to over and over. So uh, I highly recommend it. Be sure to check that out. Now I got to exit this. Let me see if I can find a little exit uh, close. Here you go. Oh, may and I may I just say that if you do purchase that book, please get the paperback. It's paperback. way way cheaper than the hardcover, and okay. it's not only that, but it's corrected. It corrects some errors from the hardcover. Okay. Okay. Uh, there yeah. were a lot of production errors in the in the hardcover, and uh, they they were mostly corrected uh, in the paperback. Wow. What about the Kindle? That's another option too, I guess, if you want to read it electronically. No, I didn't even know there was a Kindle. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's this thing called electronics. You and the <laughs> scholars, let me tell you. <laughs> Dr. Mason, this has been a thrill. I know you're starving right now. And uh Hey, I'm okay. I'm okay. I just I just wanted to get a bearing. That's all. Yeah, so, I yeah. totally get it. Thank you. I love everybody in the chat. Uh, I really appreciate all the positivity. Let's do this again. Enjoy your weekend. I've got more work coming up. And if I don't hear you, you don't see the videos before Christmas. Merry Christmas. I hope you enjoy these holidays and uh, have a blast. And don't forget, we Thank you. are Myth Vision. All right, Dr. Mason. Don't any of you have that guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game.